Why, good evening, everybody. My name is Cameron. Welcome back to the bar with an X. Tonight, we're celebrating the beauty that is farms with an X. Corns with X's. Corn. Did I mention corn? There's corn in your cocktails. Boy, how do there are corn? You know, like. <laughs> It's corn, baby, and corn's in your cocktails. I was inspired the other day as I was walking through the fields. This is kind of a lie. I live in a city. There are no fields over here. And I gazed upon the beautiful golden corral that was the fields ahead of me. It's also not corn season over here. This is also a lie. But please indulge me for a moment. And I thought to myself, my goodness, those colorful cornucopious cobs. Can you drink those? And the answer is yes. My goodness, you can drink those. Unbeknownst to me, because I am rather young at this, I'm not much of a historian, and I, 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 I don't Google things very often. There's corn everywhere. Whiskey, bourbon, that's a huge part. Or corn is a huge part of bourbon whiskey. And I kind of want to do a little bit of a... It's not really history or anything. It's just kind of for your knowledge and also for mine. And if I repeat it enough, eventually it will lie within the back of my brain so that I can just like regurgitate it to the people I know and be like, hey, did you know that bourbon has to be made with 51% corn mash? And they'd be like, wow, man, you're so smart. And I'll be like, nah, man, nah, I'm a humble guy. In any case, more than awesome popping in here. How much to have you do that entire accent the entire night. You just can't put a price on perspection there, Brad. You just can't. I don't even know what I would possibly ask for that. It would be, uh, I could do it, but we'll see. I might need some encouragement. I might need some alcohol in my body first. To be fair, I did drink a beer before stream. I don't usually do that. But um, in preparation for two weeks from now, when we do a St. Patrick's Day cocktail stream, because everything's all planned out, quick shout out to the community members who popped in on Monday. We planned everything. The entire month of month of March is more or less planned out, and it was super duper helpful. I pretty much rushed to get everything set up here for this Monday. Um, corn, that's the that's the thing. But I drank a Guinness beforehand. It was great. We has a, we has a plan. We do have a plan, and it should make the entire month more. It should make it easier for me. But because it's easier for me, that means better preparation can go into it. A better show can be planned, or at least that's that's the intent. Hopefully, we follow through on that. But in any case. You didn't come for just the boy howdies. You didn't come here for just the pretty face. I know you didn't. You came here for corn, goddammit. And that's what we're going to cover. So, corn. Corn is a grain. I see it very, very popular here in America at the very least. It's an insanely... It's an, it's an insane water guzzler. I think the last research I did in corn states that, like, it just... It uses a lot, a lot of water. And technically speaking, if you're trying to... Cons like, you're trying to grow corn in a place that is prone to drought, you don't want to grow the corn there. It's going to wind up sucking all the water that's there. But again, that's, that's for the agriculturalists to talk about. Corn is a grain. Grain goes into spirits. Grain spirits like whiskey, bourbon, and stuff. And you can distill it. Just like you can anything else. I, what I have here is some sweet corn. It's got a nice white color to it. It's kind of yellowish as well. And, uh, you know, if you take a little bite of this, which I'm actually going to do because now I'm curious about corn. It's sweet. Corn is sweet. It's a very, very tasty thing. I mean, I'm here for the corn. More than awesome is here for the corn. You should be here for the corn too. I'm here for the corn. It's off the corn. Actually, it tastes great. I don't think I've ever actually bitten into a just a raw piece of corn that we picked up at the store. Actually, one of my friends picked it up for me. It was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, but I had memories being a young child back in the fields of New Jersey. And um, there, every every once in a while, I think twice a year, they would have like a get together for the student for the young students at the local park. And next to the local park was a cornfield, a vast, vast cornfield. And I'm sure unbeknownst to the farmer that tilled those fields and cared for them, a bunch of kids anywhere between the ages of like eight or nine to like 18 were running all throughout this field and playing like manhunt or just hanging out and stuff oftentimes taking the corn literally off the stocks and chucking them haphazardly into the rest of the field for somebody um like myself to get whacked in the head with at least once or twice in my life i really didn't go back to the cornfield very much after that um, but the children of the corn exist very prominently in new jersey and although they're not featured in horror movies uh they most definitely are dangerous very dangerous indeed so 
The first thing that I kind of wanted to cover about corn is its prevalence in cocktails and spirits and stuff. To be fair, I really hadn't put a lot of thought into corn that's out there. I have one spirit, well, I have one cocktail in my collection that specifically calls for like a popcorn infused rum, which we have preparing in the freezer right now and we'll cover at the very end of this stream. So stick around if you're interested in popcorn infused rum with butter. Um, but so that, that got me thinking like, Corn is a grain. It must be in a spirit somewhere. And I thought for a while, I have this one bottle of whiskey, this one bottle of um, straight corn whiskey that I have here called Mellow Corn. And I was like, well, it's got to have a lot of corn in it. So we did a little bit of research to see what the percentage of corn is in the various different spirits that I have. And somebody very wisely pointed out that, oh, well, bourbon has to have a particular percentage of corn in its mash bill, which is essentially the percentage of grain in the grains that you wind up mashing for your spirit. And I was like, I really didn't know that. I thought for some reason it might have been like barley or wheat or something, not corn, but corn is hella prevalent here in the United States and bourbon is a United States spirits and it's got it's the United States spirit and it has a couple of laws around it that I thought would be kind of cool to explore because I don't really know too much about them and I think it'd be fun more than awesome says I think larceny is 70% mash today's first drink larceny maybe of corn of corn that is um so actually, this is kind of my plan. I'm gonna kind of go over the things about bourbon that I'm not particularly up to speed on, like the laws, the aging, the 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 mash bills and stuff like that. And then I just kind of want to try all the different corn-based or corn-percentaged whiskeys that I have, bourbons, and just kind of see how they all taste in a classic cocktail, an old-fashioned. Just a very nice way to hopefully kind of across the board, very evenly to try these different things here. I think it'd be cool if I can kind of pick out the corny characteristics of the mellow corn versus larceny versus, what is the other guy we have over here? Um, old granddad, and see if I can like almost pick out the corn flavor. Because to be fair, I don't know enough about, I guess, the flavor of corn and what it imparts into a spirit to be able to pick out like, ooh, this whiskey is 72% corn, 30% rye and negative 2% malted barley. I don't really know. Um, I don't think that it'll, I don't think the, I don't think I'll become a whiskey sommelier by the end of this episode, naturally, but I did want to give it a try. And it's a great excuse to see what different types of whiskeys, different types of bourbons do in a simple drink such as an old fashioned. Also, I haven't made an old fashioned for myself in a while. So I've been hanging around for one of those. And I had one recently at a restaurant and it was not that good. And I just wanted to know, I wanted to check, double check myself whether I just am not a fan of the old fashioned or if they just made it really, really bad. I don't really know. It seems correct. Everything's correct unless proven otherwise. And, be, and to be fair, I will put a little disclaimer here. I am not a historian. I am not trained in this. I am not a professor in this matter. So if anything seems incorrect or off, please call me out on it. It is for the benefit of not only me, the person who's trying to learn, but everybody else as well, just that so we don't like potentially spread the misinformation and stuff. That's a no-no. Um, but lucky for us, I got I got my bourbon law stuff from a very, very reputable source called Wikipedia. And such, we'll go through that. Bourbon, the legal definition, according to the United States, varies from country to country, but here it is specifically for labeling products that are at least 51% corn in grain mixture. Um, there's a bunch of other laws that go along with it as well, but suffice to say, just a quick summary of it is that if you produce bourbon in the United States, it must be aged in new charred oak casks. It must be aged for, depending on what the label on the bottle is, at a minimum of two years at differing parts in the aging process, different parts of the creation process for your bourbon. I heard stuff outside. I got distracted for a moment. Um, and there's a couple other things here as well. It was a distilled, there's a certain, there's a certain qualification on how alcoholic it can be at certain parts of the process and depending on other things. Note, another thing too is these laws don't apply to other countries, notable exceptions being the European Union and Canada. If you make bourbon in Canada or the European Union, well, I guess you can't. If you, I'm sorry, if you bottle it and you sell it, actually, those are probably more nuanced too. I believe, if I'm quoting correctly, if you sell something that is labeled bourbon in Canada, America, or the European Union, it must be made in America and it must abide by these rules here. Anywhere else in the world, if you're in like a, let's say a, uh, I don't know, like an Indian shop over in India and it says bourbon, it might be bourbon, it might apply by these laws, but it could just be something else entirely. 
I don't know what those are. I've never purchased my bourbon in India, uh, nor have I purchased bourbon literally anywhere aside from my my local store and the internet, wherever wherever Curiata gets their stuff from. I don't really know. This this bottle of mellow corn came from Curiata. No sponsorship or anything. That'd be cool though. But in any case, some of the laws that might determine whether you so, so let's say hypothetically speaking, you took. 60% of corn, mashed it up. You took 40% of rye, and you mashed it up. And you did the whole process. You put it into a barrel, you combine it with water, maybe add a little bit of sweetened stuff, you let it ferment for a while, you got it up to a really, really, you got it to a, like a 15, 18% alcohol rate, and then you started distilling it to make it even, even higher, taking all the other water there and make it relatively more alcoholic, original gravity, final gravity, and all that other mathematic stuff. And you ask yourself, okay, do I have bourbon? Well, if you ask yourself, do you have bourbon, check the following qualifications. This is going to be aside from what you may put on the bottle, but for the basis of bourbon, you must produce it in the United States or its territories, such as Puerto Rico, as well as the District of Columbia, which I've always considered to be a part of the United States. I don't know why anybody would have to go against that, but the, whoever wrote the Wikipedia article quoted that as source number 24, as it seems. It must be made from a grain mixture, a mash bill, a cereal dill, whatever you call it for whiskey. I think mash bill might just be for beer because I took a beer class once upon a time. And it has to be at least 51% corn. It must be aged in new charred oak barrels. Oak, specifically charred... I don't know. I feel like the nuance there, if I had to wonder, charred oak barrels, does it have to be like over a fire, like charcoal? Does, can it be propane, butane? Can I just like drop gasoline on a barrel, set it on fire, and if it still contains the liquid, can I can I say it's can I say it's bourbon if I age it properly? I, I wonder. The concept of gasoline whiskey or gasoline bourbon, as uh, I'm now thinking of, which um, you could just say fireball, which is basically just gasoline, um, but uh, I don't know if that would, apply from, uh, that would apply to the United States bourbon standards. In addition, your bourbon, when you're creating it, cannot be distilled to more than 160 proof, that's 80% alcohol by volume, if it's entered into a container for aging after you've distilled it to a certain percentage, it can't be any more than 125 proof, 6.25% alcohol by volume. I think what that means is, if I'm interpreting this correctly, again, I'm not a law guy either, and this is only an article from Wikipedia, so take this as you will. That if you were distill, if you were at the process where you have, let's say, like a, a like a, a corn beer right now, a really high proof, like almost corn wine, and you want to start distilling it, if you are going to age it, it can't go above 125 proof. I guess if you're not going to age it at that point in the process, you could go it all the way up to 80% proof. It can't be any more than that. Um, in addition, after the fact, if you've gotten through the aging process, when you bottle it, it has to be at 80 proof or more, evidently. One of the things that I happen to have, because uh, there's a couple other labels on the bottle too, is this thing called Bottled and Bond under United States government supervision, which means a very particular thing. I had my buddy Eric on here, me, on here a little while ago, and I believe if I'm recalling what he said is that Bottled and Bond has to be at a particular percentage, and it has to be of a particular barrel. I don't think that you can take whiskeys, bourbons from multiple different barrels, put them, put them all in the same thing and call it Bottled and Bond. I'm pretty sure it has to be from the same thing. I might be getting that mixed up with like small batch bourbons or otherwise, but again, this is more or less just play. Most of this is going to be making cocktails and stuff. That's where I think that's where my talents shine. Bottled and bond stuff is so great. And unbeknownst to me, Brad, I had all the whiskeys that I bought were all bottled and bond. After Thankmas, when we had this Rittenhouse rye bottled and bond for the wonderful, wonderful Manhattans that were being made, I went and got some more whiskey, and lo and behold, and I didn't even look for it, every single bottle I have, except for one, except for the Larceny, which is not bottled and bond, it's 92% uh, or 92 proof. Is 40, 46% alcohol, I think. Yeah, that's how that math works. Um, it's not bottled and bond, but uh, the, good, the good stuff is good. The one of the advantages about bottled and bond is it's gonna come in at a higher proof. It's gonna be more alcohol. At least, I, th I think it's gotta be at least 100 proof, which is 50% alcohol by volume, which means you can, uh, you can, I guess, add a bit more mixture, add a little, a little bit more mixer to your cocktails. You can add a little more dilution to it, um, whatever works best for you, and it plays differently. It's stronger. It's got more flavor because lo and behold, in the process of creating creating infusions and whatnot, when you have something that is higher alcohol content, it'll rip more of the flavor out of it. 
mathematically speaking, there is a higher potential difference between what doesn't have the flavor and what does have the flavor. And what doesn't have the flavor is the alcohol, but it's a strong alcohol. So relatively speaking, it's got even less of that concentration or more pulling power, more osmotic pressure, more sucking power. Um, when, you, when you suck the herbs dry, you suck the corn dry, that's how you make bourbon or, or, or whiskey and otherwise. So, there's so, so the, to summarize so far, there are laws pertaining to what the percentage of the grain is inside of your bourbon. There's laws pertaining to how high an alcohol content you can have in it during the aging process, the bottling process, and otherwise. Um, there's some other information on aging as well. Bourbon, according to Wikipedia, does not have a minimum specified age for its age, uh, for minimum specified time for its aging period. So hypothetically speaking, if you're going to take your corn wine, your corn rye wine, and turn it into whiskey without, uh, after your distillation process, but with no aging, you could, you could probably bottle it at 80 proof is I think is what I was going at. It's gotta be 80 proof or more. And it said, can't be distilled any more than 160 proof, but if it's going to aging, it can't be more than 125. So if I did that math correctly and logic correctly, if you are going to bottle it right at, but without any aging at all, it has to be somewhere in between 80 proof to 125 proof. If you were going to put it into a container for aging, it has to also be, oh, it's gotta be no more than 125 proof. Can be distilled more than 160. So I guess actually there really is no limit. Anywhere between 80 and 160, you can just bottle it. But if you're going to age it, it can't be any more than 125 proof. That is to say, information. Editor Cameron is going to put some helpful tips up here in the corner. Just kidding. He won't. I'm not going to do that. Because I don't really do much editing, to be honest. Bourbon doesn't have a specific age to be aged for. Products aged for as little as three months are sold as bourbon. The exception is straight bourbon. If your bottle says straight bourbon, this mellow corn says straight corn whiskey, which I'm just going to take a gander that, um, that it's... It maybe applies the same rules. Like if you're gonna call it straight whiskey, maybe it has to be, uh, there's an aging requirement too. I don't actually know. Let me grab one of the bourbons instead because technically speaking, this doesn't say bourbon on it at all. It's just whiskey with an E. One of the ones that does say bourbon is the old grain. So let me take a look at that. We have bottles that we can use to fact check ourselves. It says on here, bottled, bonded, high rye, mash bill, but it is bourbon whiskey, straight bourbon whiskey. So this, whatever law I'm about to read does apply to Old Grandin in this case. If it is labeled straight and it has been aged for under four years, it mu must be labeled what the duration of the aging process was. I don't see anything on Old Granddad saying less than four years. I do see something on the back that says, Bonded bourbon is the product of one distillery and one distiller in a single season, barreled for at least four years and bottled at exactly 100 proof. So I, I am to think that the old granddad himself and the United States government is telling me that this bourbon has been aged for at least four years. And if they're lying to me, I don't want to look into it anymore because I don't want to be disappointed. These rules apply to straight bourbon whiskey. Bourbon that has an age stated on its label must be labeled with the age of the youngest whiskey in the bottle. Evidently, the whole bourbon aspect of it, it can be blended. It doesn't have to just be one type of bourbon, but if you're going to put a couple of different types of bourbon constituents in there, the youngest aged one must be the one labeled on the bottle. If you mix like a four year with a five year with a three year, it must be labeled three year. You have to. Uh, I guess if it falls below that four-year threshold is the assumption that I'm making there. Bourbon that has an age stated uh, must be the label of the youngest whiskey, not counting the age of any added neutral grain spirits in a bourbon that is labeled as blended as neutral grain spirits are not considered whiskey under the regulations or are not required to be aged at all. To be fair, neutral grain spirit, I don't know what, are, what a neutral grain spirit is. I would think something like, I think Everclear, which is just a very, very high proof general grain spirit i guess you could probably stick some everclear in there and that would apply because there are no restri restrictions on aging for your grain spirits i learned that today straight whiskey which applies to the mellow corn on this side because it is not straight bourbon but straight whiskey as defined in the united states law is whiskey that is distilled from a fermented malted or unmalted cereal grain mash to a concentration not exceeding 80 percent alcohol by volume if you were 80 percent alcohol by volume you wouldn't exceed 160 proof this is 100 proof 50% alcohol by volume. So I don't think mellow corn is breaking any laws there, naturally. If 
It must be aged, also in the new charred oak barrels, for at least two years at a concentration not exceeding 62.5% at the start of the aging process, which I believe was mentioned above as well, at the 125 proof mark. This point here is actually kind of interesting because it is saying that despite the fact that this, this bottle, from what I can tell, is not labeled bourbon whatsoever, it still applies by the bourbon law of needing to be aged in new charred oak barrels. So I wonder, hypothetically speaking, if you were gonna take your corn, rye, wine product before the distillation process, and you don't, let's say, you don't put it in a charred oak barrel. If you were making this at home, you didn't have access to something like that. You could probably call it whiskey. You definitely couldn't call it bourbon. You could call it, I guess you couldn't call it straight whiskey either. There wouldn't even be a straight label anywhere on it. Perhaps you have a bent whiskey. Who really knows? Interesting. There are also other labels that you can find on your, uh, find on your bourbon bottles, uh, such as Bottled and Bond. It's a subcategory, and it must be aged for at least four years. And according to the back of the old granddad, Bottled and Bond also means it was from one distillery and one distiller in a single season. That kind of goes to the whole, you're not mixing and matching with stuff. If it's Bottled and Bond, it was bottled in bond bond i would suppose meaning the bonding casks maybe that you the, the barrels and whatnot I'm not so sure that's for the etymologist to uh, decipher in addition high rye bourbon which i have here the old granddad is a high rye mash bill is not legally defined, but it usually means that the bourbon has a 20 to 35% rye ratio in its mash bill. High wheat bourbons are, cons are described as more mild and subdued compared to high rye variety va varieties. I don't believe any of the ones I have here are high in wheat. Then again, it depends on what you consider to be high in wheat. As we've talked about a lot about mash bills so far, I think it's wise to bring out all the different whiskeys that we got over here. Um, whiskey is a rather under underexplored in my collection, mostly because I know there's a lot of whiskeys out there. I know there's a lot of bourbons out there. I don't exactly know the difference between all of them. And to be fair, when you're just kind of starting out, when it says calls for bourbon or whiskey, I more or less would just sub out one for the other. If it said ride whiskey, I could put a little bit of corn in there. I didn't really care uh, for the most part. But as I'm getting deeper and deeper into this whole, the, the, the particular tastes and combos that you get, as well as the culture behind it too, it is I feel like important to at least contextualize why it's specified for bourbon whiskey or why it's specified for rye whiskey or why it may just be unspecified entirely. I think that's kind of interesting. But so a high rye bourbon like Old Granddad, which has 27% rye in it, um, like I said, has to be anywhere between 20 to 35% rye. Now, naturally, we have this rye whiskey over here, specifically Rittenhouse rye, straight rye whiskey. Remember, straight whiskey. If it's labeled as straight whiskey, at least according to this Wikipedia article that I found, then it must be from uh, fermented cereal grain mashed not to exceed a concentration of 80% or 160 proof by volume and aged in new charred oak barrels. So that makes me think, and I wonder if our Rittenhouse rye actually specifies on the back, whether it was actually aged in the new charred oak barrels. Again, it says straight whiskey. This also says straight whiskey. This is straight whiskey with an E in the middle, and this is straight whiskey without the E in the middle. Is that significant from a legal standpoint? I have no freaking idea. But the back of this bottle says, written how straight rye whiskey is a storied Pennsylvania state rye style rye with heritage, whose heritage commemorates Philadelphia's famous Rittenhouse Square. I've been there a couple times. Still bottled and bond under U.S. government supervision to meet the strictest requirements the Rittenhouse you enjoy today carries forth the distinct and spicy flavor profile established long ago. It doesn't say anything on here about bottles or our particular types of bourbon bottles and whatnot or bourbon charred oak casks or whether they were charred or oak to begin with more than awesome says written house is a nice solid rye if you're looking for something hot in a cocktail it's true the people have described rye whiskeys as being a little more spicy have a little bit more of a bite to them and i was doing a little bit of a comparison for some of these whiskeys the other day um on monday when we were going through some planning and also off off screen as well and i would say comparatively the whiskeys that have more rye in them have that spice component. It's a lot more like, supposedly they say that oak barrels will impart vanilla, cinnamon, um, clove type flavors into the spirits that they that sit within them and age within them. But I'd say that's more so for something that has rye as a part of the mash bill. Where that comes from is a chemist's problem, not my problem. But in any case, we move on. High rye bourbon. The bottle and bond over here, the rye whiskey, can't be considered high rye bourbon because it's too high. 
the percentage is too high. If this is 51% rye, which it is, it's greater than that 35% threshold, which is that window where you can actually call it high rye bourbon. So this is why the old granddad, because it's in the 27% range, is a high rye bourbon, but also why the written house over here is not a bourbon it's probably there, there's other laws and stuff that there's a lot of overlap here that i'm sure if we drew like venn diagrams and stuff would probably be fun to go through but i just i just don't have the patience for that if that's something that's interesting we want a venn diagram we'll go for it although it might be inaccurate we might have, i have to, to take my research off stream too but there's one last note that I have here at the very bottom of my notes, and it says that bourbon that has been aged fewer than three years cannot legally be referred to as whiskey, with an E, or whiskey, without the E, in the EU, the European Union. And there's a, there's, there's a link for that too. Very interesting. So, I guess trying to summarize everything, there is a, an aging requirement. There are alcohol percentage requirements. There are constituent requirements, like what type of grain that you actually put in there. Depending on the label on the bottle, there's other aging requirements. There's, there's, oh God, there's so much to it. This is a very, very confusing world as it seems. Brad says, we need a man's math stream later, but we can't drink during it because math do less good when done does the drunk um actually i'm trying to think when i was still in college um at the very very legal age of 21 i assure you and i was doing very high upper level mathematics because i'm an engineer by education um yeah uh i might have drank it a little bit while i did my homework specifically for calculus um differential and partial differential equations and what else do we do complex math and graduate level probability and you know what I'm, I'm kind of glad I'm doing more drinking now and not as much math. I'm very, very happy about that. I think I'm, I think I'm more happy with that. In any case, this is kind of a whole, that was a whole little summary of the best that I could find on bourbon, bourbon laws and stuff. There's also a ton of history too. And I will, I will say, I'm not going to go into it specifically, but there's a book that I'm going to grab in a moment that does a really, really good job of going through just spirits in general. And it has some really, really great sections on corn, rye, wheat, whiskey, bourbon, specifically as it's, as it pertains to the United States, bourbon and whiskey, as it portrays to more the Highland areas of Scotland. And I, I think if I say the Highland is Ireland, I don't know if I'm correct in saying that or not. I believe Scotland is considered the Highlands, but like Irish whiskey, stuff like that, Scotch as well. It does a really, really nice job of going through and kind of recollecting all the important parts, I'd say. And again, this is merely my opinion, and I'm not really the source of truth on this anyway. It's called The Ultimate Guide to Spirits and Cocktails by Andre Domine, and it is a, whew, this is a heaping book. Let me tell you, a very heaping book indeed. Actually, I wanna see what this sounds like if I drop it on the floor. I think something fell over. That was actually kinda of loud. <laughs> I felt it rumble too. In any case, bourbon. We have talked at length about bourbon. My goodness, we spent so much time on bourbon already, but like, what does it taste like? What do you what do you what do you do with your bourbon? I'm gonna put the Rittenhouse rye away because I'm actually very curious to compare all the stuff. Well, actually, maybe I won't put the rye away. Maybe I won't. Because what I wanted to do is I wanted to do a comparison using the old fashioned, which uses whiskey, some sort of sweetening agent. You could use a sugar cube, you could use simple syrup, you could put a little orange peel in there, um, and some Angostura bitters as well. And I wanna see what all these taste like in a simple old fashioned. Made exactly the same way, all we do is we sub out what whiskey's on the inside. And I wanted to do it in reverse order. I wanted to go from the highest corn percentage Let's, let's go over that now, right? The highest corn percentage that we have is mellow corn, straight corn whiskey, coming in at 90% corn, 10% uh, rye, and malted barley. The combo there is the is the 10% there. We have larceny, single batch, not bottled in bond, coming in at 92 proof, has 68% of corn, 20% whiskey, and 12% of malted barley. Old Granddad, bottled in bond, high rye mash bill, has 63% corn, lower than the larceny, but 27% rye. Considered high rye because it falls both in between between that, I believe it was 20 to 35% range. And then we have Rittenhouse Rye, which actually does have corn in it. It has a 51% rye, but it also has 37% corn. So you can't consider it a bourbon because it doesn't reach that, reach that corn threshold. Oh, and 12% malted barley as well. More Than Awesome says, that is a chunky book. Go lower proof to higher, or you'll burn out your palate. Indeed, I say lower proof to higher, but I guess technically, you know, the only thing that's lower proof here is the larceny so that order just doesn't apply if i did do that the larceny would come first and then we jump up to the corn and then down i think i 
think we'll be all right. I think we'll be a-okay. Um, and I do have some water on standby. I actually, this is a question for the crowd at large, for people who like, let's say, taste a lot more whiskey than I do, taste a lot more wine than I do, taste a lot more spirits than I do. What is the best way to cleanse your palate between sips like this? I know usually what you wind up doing is if you're doing a lot of tastings like that, you'll kind of take a little sip of it and you swirl it around, spit it out, and I think drink some water. I know crackers are probably helpful. I've, I've been told too that, you know, when you eat sushi, because I love to eat fish, that you take ginger and you bite a little bit of it to cleanse your palate for the next piece of sushi, the next nigori, the next sashimi. Um, and I've tried that a couple times and it does actually work, but I don't know if, I don't know of chewing ginger in between let's say old fashions is the right way to go i'm not exactly sure so if anybody has any suggestions i'm totally open to it in any case so now what we'll do is we'll move on we're not just talking about bourbon anymore because now we've got our rittenhouse rye in there so my board is no longer accurate bourbon it's got corn rittenhouse rye it's also got corn we're gonna move on to make a few old fashions specifically to explore what happens when you sub out different types of whiskeys? It's in different types of bourbon, but it's also different types of whiskeys because we've got a whiskey in there. And technically speaking, again, the corn mellow, the uh, mellow corn is also not bourbon. I, I forgot to say that too. We got whiskey, whiskey, bourbon, 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 whiskey, whiskey, bourbon, whiskey, bourbon, whiskey, whiskey, bourbon, whiskey, bourbon. You got all that? Old fashions. And old fashioned um, is is a I, I have a, a rough history with old fashions because for some reason I always get old fashions and Manhattan's mixed up. Um, however, I am specifically going by the book this time. I am not going to leave it up to my own wiles to potentially completely fuck up an old fashioned. So instead, I brought out Mr. Dave Arnold here to instruct me on how to best do an old fashioned. And he's got a particular recipe in here that I will share that I'm going to modify for the purposes of this exercise here. I have just have to get to the right page. I'll search for that. I mean, so it's more than awesome. I do a little bit of water, um, and, but, a, but he drinks a lot of bourbon. We go once a week and have for at least four years to our old-fashioned bourbon bar. Ooh. So the idea of a bourbon bar, there is, Anna and I, I say we frequent Disney, but like we really haven't gone recently. Um, but there is, I think, I think the bar, I think the restaurant's name has a pig in it or something, something related to a pig, like swine or happy swine happy pig or something and they have an entire whiskey bourbon collection and i wanted to go in there and i really wanted to try some things around this was like two or three years ago when i was really first starting getting into this and i thought to myself no i don't think it's a good idea to do mostly because i don't think i'd be able to like put in the like really really concentrate on the flavors i at that point in time barely even knew how to taste spirits in general so to go in there and be like i want a flight of whiskeys it would probably just taste like burn i probably wouldn't be able to learn anything from it but i think now i've got a little bit more a few more tools in my belt to distinguish between flavors pick out particular notes of fruit spices and otherwise and also also the technique of not burning your nostrils you know I also just realized I've been flipping through the index of this book and I can't apparently do the alphabet in my head while I'm speaking. So let me find the right page for the old fashioned so I can go there. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, H, K, L, M, N, O, 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 L, M, I found the M, I found P, I found O, oh, old fashioned, 107, there we go, we got it. Um, I would consider myself a relatively smart, intelligent individual. However, I struggle with alphabetical order. Anytime I have to do, anytime I have to do the months, I have to do them all out. I get out January, February, March, April, May, June, July, so on and so forth. Anytime I have to do the alphabet, I have to go all the way from the beginning. A B C D E F G H I J K L M N O L M N O P. I have to every single time. And like, there's a piece of it that's kind of embarrassing, but whatever. Who really cares? Brett says we found a great place at City Walk outside of Universal that had an amazing bourbon selection. And then he drank all the things. We all have struggles. We all do, indeed. Says Rye Cerrone. Well, well put. Well, well put. Rye Cerrone, sir, Roni, the Rye. I will only be making that joke once only while the bottle still stands. So, according to Dave Arnold, there are ways to make your old fashioned. And according to the man himself, there really isn't a right way to make your old fashioned. Some people would say, you have to use the sugar cube in there. Others would say, you can just use some simple syrup. You can do whatever we want to, so long as you have some whiskey in there, you got something to sweeten it, 
You got some bitters. And I guess you could probably do without any sort of like peel in there, like orange and stuff. It's whatever you want to do. Well, Dave Arnold says that the best old fashioned that he's, he's ever had is called the Cliff Old Fashioned. Uh, it's named for his friend Clifford Gilbert. They were making coriander soda for an event, and it's similar to kind of ginger ale, refreshing, spicy, a hint of warmth. And after making a batch of syrup, the coriander syrup, they decided to use that in their old fashioned, and apparently it was just, just delightful. So what we have here, the the drink recipe that I'm going to follow for all of our old fashions here is going to use two dashes of Angostura bitters. I will grab those from down here. I, I hope I have, I have enough Angostura bitters down here somewhere. Oh yeah, I do. I'm, I'm sure I'll be fine. Two ounces of whatever bourbon you use. He recommends Elijah Craig 12 year. And then it says here three eighths of an ounce or about 11 milliliters of your syrup. I am instead going to opt for the sugar cube because I made some sugar cubes, and uh, and then you put an orange twist in there. Um, they also, he was also saying too that if you're going to make an old fashioned, don't put your fruit at the bottom of the glass. Don't muddle up your fruit at the bottom of the glass. I think that's debated. When I originally learned how to make an old fashioned, I was told what you do is you add your sugar cube, you add a little bit of water to get it wet, you put your orange peel in there, and then you muddle it around. Um, I don't know. So here's a question. This will decide how we do the old fashions. Do you prefer the orange peel muddled at the bottom with the sugar or expressed on top and rimmed around? I am curious. More than awesome saying, place we always go does just sugar and tap water and way more bitters than you'd think you'd need. The first old fashioned that Brad had was at a place called Armadillo Grill and they muddled the hell of it. Don't play with your food it is much better when you don't muddle it. I am not going to muddle it. I'm gonna let the sugar. I'm gonna let the sugar do its thing. I'm gonna put it at the bottom. It's gonna do its thing. We're gonna do. We're gonna do a stirring motion too. So things are going to happen. It'll be great. Express your peel. Always express your peel. All right. So we're gonna get started on this. I'm gonna put this off to the side just so I don't forget. I was originally expecting to do th three old fashions, so I have three completely identical glasses that I'm gonna take out. But the Rittenhouse Rye was a shock to me. I labeled out the mash bill on on Monday, and I was like. Oh, I shouldn't not include it. So one of these glasses is going to be the odd one out. It's just just how it's going to be. We'll do uh, we'll do this one. I'll put them in front just so it's easier. Rice Aroni says, "Express yourself," and then your peel. That makes sense. I'm expressing myself right now. I'm expressing myself all over my bar. God, somebody's got to clean this shit up. And just do a cherry. Ah, cherry's a good idea too. I actually do have some cherries as well. You definitely do that. All right, so. The, the way that I think is going to be the best comparison is I want to make sure that I taste the old fashioned before it has a chance that dilute to dilute too far. So I'm going to make them in this order. I'm going to do the little stirring technique, do the express and the peel and all that stuff. And I'm going to give it a taste. I'm going to try to come up with some notes. And I'm going to do that every single time I make the old fashioned. And then at the end, when all of them had a little bit of chance to kind of wait around a little bit, dilute a little bit, warm up a little bit, infuse more with the sugary characteristics, I'm going to go back from the beginning to the end and try it all over again and see if the, the exposure to the air, the oxidation, the warming, the dilution affects it which it definitely will. I was informed of a phenomenon called blooming that will occur when you take a little bit of water and you add it to your whiskeys and stuff. Apparently there's a lot of like flavor components, phenols and stuff on a chemical level that don't really get a chance to express themselves until you bloom the spirit by putting a little bit of water on the inside of it, which I do happen to have a dropper and I'm, I'm inclined to add a little bit of water. But um, I don't really know, really. It all depends. Rice already says, can we change this drink's name to The Boomer? The Boomer. Oh, I assure you, I there are definitely more than just boomers drinking old fashions out here. Although I will say, if you are so particular about your old fashions that you're going to look at a millennial zier like myself and be like, you're making your old fashioned wrong, kid, then I will call you a boomer and I'll say, that's fine. You don't have to stay at this bar. Nobody's forcing you to be here. Get out. In any case, howdy. And good day to those folks. I'm gonna need, I need my glass. I'm gonna need some ice cubes, so I'm gonna grab myself some ice cubes. Actually, these glasses are kind of difficult to spin the cubes into, so I'm gonna get some ice spheres because I have a couple of those on standby. It's the. Oh, I also just remembered. At the end, we're doing a popcorn infuse, a popcorn, a buttered popcorn infused spirit drink uh, called the Cinema Highball, and I currently have rum with butter sitting in my freezer, and I just made that over the past couple days, uh, over the past couple days, so it is going to be fresh, 
fresh popcorn butter rum. So if you're interested in that stuff, stick around. Um, More than awesome says the bourbon place we go to is, go to in sport import in sport, imports in limestone water and serves it with flights. The limestone water, my goodness! I remember, um, I remember from my wine class that I took. I took a beer class and I took a beer class and I took a wine class. And one of the things that they would do in wine culture is called Burtonization. They would literally take water from. Burton on Burton on Trent, I think is the name of the city in France or England or something. I don't really remember. They would literally take the water, ship it to different parts of the country and elsewhere just so you could use the Burton water in your wines because it made a huge difference. There was something about the soil over there that really, really made the difference in the wine. Now, with modern technology, some say, some purists would say, no, 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 you have to use the water. You can't, you can't mimic it with science. Science doesn't apply there. However, if you completely characterize the water and you determine what minerals are inside of it, whether the constituents are inside of it, and you replicate that, you can absolutely, at least from my belief, be able to completely replicate the water that you bring in, whether it be limestone water, Fiji water, spring water, Burton water, whatever. Modern science has got you covered. And uh, the beauty of modern science, if you can just make it in a lab and you have a lab nearby and you can't pay shipping costs, then good for you. You've saved a little bit of money there. Same with Kentucky limestone water, perhaps, probably. Gotta get limestone everywhere. I think I think limestone. There was a um near my parents' house. We had a oh actually I didn't put my hold on a second I didn't put my sugar cube in there. Where are my sugar cubes? Oh, there we are. Need some sugar cubes. One sugar cube in there. They're like a brownish sugar, so it might affect things a little bit. But just don't use Flint water. Oh, you mean like Flint, Michigan? My bro's got the lead out there. Gotta get the lead out somehow. Might as well put it in your children. <laughs> nice job, Michigan. Good job on you. So what did I do? I added some sugar there. I dropped an ice ball on top of it. Why not? This is the way that we're doing things around here. I'm gonna add two ounces of the Angostura bitters right up on top of that. It's gonna have a chance to kind of meld in with the sugar below. One, two, that's all you're getting. And then we're gonna add two ounces of our bourbon of choice. No, it's not bourbon. It's straight corn whiskey. You gotta catch me on that or else I might just make a mistake. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go the full, I'm gonna go my full jigger here. So it's gonna be about 60, it's gonna be 60 milliliters, about two ounces of this stuff. Mmm, mm-mm, delicious. And if I'm correct to say, let me do a real quick check because I wanna make sure that I'm not like skipping steps here. So I'm gonna slow down for a moment um, and take, take a check. Syrup, orange twist, Straw or short mixing rod to mix it, and a build on fashions, and an unchilled glass represents a relatively large amount of thermal mass at room temperature. Actually, let's, let's just... In the words of Dave Arnold, the instructions on how to make your old fashioned, as my ice slowly but surely melts just a little bit, just, just a little bit, I promise I'll read fast. I don't build old fashions in chilled glasses. An unchilled glass represents a relatively large thermal mass at room temperature. When you make a drink in a glass at room temperature, you have to melt a good bit of ice to chill the glass down with the temperature of the drink. This extra bit of melting adds to the initial dilution of the drink, which I like. You can overcome this by stirring the drink more after you build it, but then the initial drink will be cooler, which I don't like, says Dave Arnold. Also, while chilled glasses look great when they are fresh, they attract condensation and don't look good on a drink like the old fashioned, which is meant to be sipped. Fine points like this, whether to chill a glass or not, are all a matter of personal preference, but alas, you do you. And um, there's a bunch of other stuff there. There's an entire other two pages on how to do it. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna wing it. Two ounces. In this case, we've got mellow corn. Mellow corn smells like, does it smell like corn? Maybe. Maybe it smells like corn. I honestly, I honestly don't know. Hmm. One can never be so sure. And we're going to stir it just, uh, just a bit and see that. Let me see. I think the other, I think this is called for another cocktail angle. Let's see that. Watch me stir this drink, dude. Watch me stir this drink, dude. You like it when I stir drinks? Stirring drinks. Gotta give that a stir. What number of seconds? Well, they say that you should go for eight seconds or so. Or so. I think that's probably good. Nice. And now what we're going to do is we're going to, the final step of the process is we're going to take an orange. We're going to give it an appeal. I bought these organic ones today and they've been firmly washed around and I used my palms to take the sticker off. Get out, get out of here. Get out. Get, get, get out of here. Stupid sticker. I need a peeler. Where's my peeler live? There's, here's one peeler. I just like that peeler. I really don't like this peeler. I'm going to see, I'm going to see, I'm going to see if this, 
Let me see if this peeler here does does good. I have two types of peelers. Let's see. I'm gonna grab the one as well to show you the difference and why I like one, but not the other. Oh yeah, yeah, yes. Here we go. I found the other one. I got two peelers. One is this guy. I don't like it, probably because the, the blade is dull. And then I got this one too. I just find that like, personally, with this one, you take it and you peel like this. I don't know. I don't feel like I get as much leverage as I do like this. But you know, to each their own. Do y'all have a preference? Very curious. Seven is heaven, says Riceroni. Seven, eight. Hey, why was six afraid of seven? Was it because seven, eight, nine? No is because seven was a registered six offender. Get an orange peel. I'm gonna use the, yep, I said I'd use the bad one and I already hate it. So get over there, I don't want it. Oh yeah, that's a nice peel. Oh my goodness, oh, I dropped it on the floor. That was a nice peel though. That was a nice one. And also too, when you're peeling, you're trying not to get too much of the pith in there. I wouldn't say that I'm a master at that and I dropped it again. But you know what? That orange is gonna stay over there. What do you gotta do? You gotta express the orange peels, wipe it around, and drop it in. That's your old fashioned. More than awesome, say, oh yeah, you got more, you gotta move the fruit, not your hands, naturally. Move the fruit, not your hands when you're peeling. So the new one you love is the fancy cocktail one. It's the fancy cocktail, I love this one so much. I bought this on a whim because I wanted to make sure that I had two for a particular stream. And um, I was like, my God, this one's so much better. It's great. So, we have a mellow corn old fashioned right here. Mellow corn has 90% corn and 10% rye and malted barley. In this old fashioned, what do we get from it? I smell orange naturally, but what about the sippage? Remember, as Dave Arnold says, your old fashioned is meant to be sipped. It's not meant to be guzzled down, you heathen. Go to a different bar. We're a sipping bar over here, not a sucking bar. This bar doesn't suck, it sips. Ooh, it's got a kick to it. It's basically just, it's basically whiskey. It is powerful. Remember, this is a bottle and bond as well. So it's at a higher proof than the other ones. And to be fair, I don't really know exactly what I'm getting to it. I feel like I suffer uh, making comparison, make, picking out flavor components if I don't have something to compare it to. This is the first one that I've had so far. So compared to the other ones, I have no comparison yet. But I would say overall, it tastes like whiskey. We've got a little bit of cinnamony note from the uh, Angostura bitters in there. And um, I'm gonna go at it again because I've been talking too much. Right, Cerrone says, I use the one on my barman's bottle opener. Ooh, I, also got, I gotta get one of those too, like one of those like bar multi-tools and stuff. It's got a peeler on it, got a zoodler on it, channeler on it, a knife. Knives are cool. Should definitely have more knives on this bar. Hmm. So, I would say that it has a, almost like a cool vegetal cool vegetal flavor to it. I don't remember, I know I was giving some notes on Monday when I tasted the mellow corn, the larceny, and the old granddad, and I think one of them was a little vegetally. I don't remember if it was the mellow, mellow corn or not. It might have been the larceny, I'm not exactly sure. But there is a almost almost grassy, fieldy component to what I'm tasting here, it seems. It's also got the burn, I feel that as well. But in terms of picking out particular characteristics, it's kind of difficult for me to do that. So I need a reference. So I think I will not dwell too much on the corn and I will make my way to the next old fashioned we have. I don't want to potentially contaminate one old fashioned with the, with the juices of another. So I'm just gonna real quickly just rinse out my jigger here and discard the water into my honorary bucket that is sitting on the side. The next one we have to make is with Larceny. It is not bottled in bond. However, it is bourbon, 68% corn, 20% wheat, which hasn't appeared yet so far, and 12% malted barley, which did technically appear in the metal, metal corn, but it, there's some combo there with the rye that makes up 10%, uh, the other 10% other than the corn in mellow corn. So what will we need? I'm gonna grab myself a sugar cube, Pop that. I'll go back and I will grab myself another ice ball from the freezer. I have four ice balls, which is which is good. Now they're all like varying degrees of quality. So um, honestly, my my ice balls they um they not they're not super bally. So uh, some of them have like this uh got a little not as bally with it. So instead, what I just kind of been doing is like uh you know just kind of like 
Just get all the pieces off of it. The water's not too bad. I'll, uh, so long as it's not screwing things up. So long as it's not, like, in my camera, then I think the water's probably fine. I'll drop that in there on top of the other sugar cube. And I'll add some bitters on top of it. How many bitters? One bitters. How many dashes of the bitters? Two. Our flavor, Angostura. One, two. And that's all. We don't need any more. And then, naturally, we're going to add our two ounces, about 60 milliliters of the bourbon of your choice. This one's actually a bourbon. Wheated Mourbon Bash Bill, it says. So I guess Wheated might be another particular label. Wheated because it's got 20% wheat. I wonder, I wonder, because the high rye percentage was between, I think it was 20 and 35 um, for those types of spirits, if it's labeled high rye, I wonder if you call it Wheated, whether the same percentages apply. Whether if you say it's a Wheated Bourbon, if you have to have in between 20 to 35% of that in there. I'm honestly not so sure. Ooh. Put that in front to denote where we are next. Larceny. And I also need a peel. Let's go get a peel. Peeling it. I'm also trying not to get too much of the pith as well. It's just a technique thing. Just trying, trying my bestest here. Let's see. This time we'll capture, I guess, the, the orange, the, the, uh, the, the, the goo, the goo being expressed. It. Uh, can we see that? Goo. There we go. Goo. Goo. Goo Goo Power Rangers. Absolutely delicious. Or at least so we so we keep telling ourselves, it seems. Let's see what that tastes like. This was the Larceny. The Larceny Old Fashioned with 68% corn. This is, comparatively, less corn. About 22% less corn. Excuse me. Than the Mellow Corn. We have... 20% wheat in it. We did not have wheat in the other one, so there's going to be a wheat component there. Again, probably won't be able to piece out in particular, but we also have a known percentage of malted barley, 12%. There is no rye in the larceny. Another thing to note that I found with the mellow corn that I just didn't comment on, but I'm realizing now was spice. There was a spicy component to it, and that was probably from the 10%, probably from the Angostura, naturally, with the cinnamon notes, but also probably from the 10% of rye potentially in there. That's what I, that's what I'm in, that's what I'm assuming. Vio just popped in saying, hey Cam. Hey Vio, how's it going? Lessening, old fashioned. It smells like oranges because I expressed an orange peel over top of it. Naturally, take a sip. What I've been told to do when you sip your whiskeys is you let your air out, you take your sip, and then you let the air back in so it doesn't like burn everything, you know? Let's give that a try. Mmm. Mm. I would say, based off of the bite of the corn cob that I took about 30 minutes ago, I'd say this tastes more like corn than the mellow corn does. It does. I'm actually getting like those, that sweet corn taste from the larceny. And it could be from a couple of different factors. It could be because there's no rye in there. That's a different, it's a fundamentally different collection of grains in there. It also is not as high proof as the mellow corn. This is 92 proof as opposed to a hundred proof. That might be where that's coming from. Again, it's also kind of bitey. Not as bitey as the mellow corn, probably from the alcohol content there, but I'm gonna take one more sip. Vio says, corn is my favorite vegetable. I love this. Not to be pedantic, but technically corn is a grain. But to be fair, you know that you wouldn't put, you wouldn't like make oatmeal with corn. So you should make cornmeal with corn. Hmm. I think for all intents and purposes, corn can be utilized as a vegetable, just like tomatoes can be utilized as vegetables, despite the fact that they're fruits. Hmm. Yeah, it's almost like spicy corn. Now that I had a bite of the corn, I think my mind's been attuned to it. It kind of tastes like spicy corn. Actually, I'm gonna go back to the, I wanna go back to the corn and I wanna take another bite of it. Cause I wanna see if that's actually what I'm getting there. Oh my God. Yeah, man. <laughs> Boy, howdy. Kind of tastes like corn. Interesting. That's kind of cool. I like that. I wasn't expecting that at all. I wasn't expecting to actually pick out the corn from there. More so from the larceny than I did with the mellow corn. 
And so now what I want to do too is when I go back to the mellow core and see if I it was just it was whatever I was smoking, you know. I want to try it again. I'm kind of breaking my own rule here, but I'm going back to the mellow cord. Oh, you know what? I forgot to stir this one. Hmm. That might have been. That might be a piece of it. That that was a move. That was my boo boo. Boo boo my part. Yeah, it's definitely not as corny. I mean, a little bit. Corny, corny in terms of like almost tortilla chip. Maybe I have a tortilla chips. I believe the tortilla chips like Tostitos and stuff are corn based. This, the mellow corn, tastes more like the corn of a tortilla chip than the larceny. The larceny tastes more like the corn of the cob itself, if I had to be more specific on that. More Than Awesome says, I've posted a picture of me and my larceny bottle to prove we're bourbon bros in the hashtag on topic in the Discord. Larceny is probably the best corn bottle you have up there. I do like the larceny. It is very corny. And I, I honestly did not have that comparison. Because I tried, again, I tasted it on Wednesday for just a, as a little bit of a precursor. I and mean, I don't remember, honestly, I really should have written, written down my tasting notes. I don't remember what they were. Um... I want to say, if it was in this order, then the corn was more fieldy, the larceny was more vegetal, like more vegetally, more bright, almost sweet, and then the old granddad was a different direction. I don't remember what my tasting notes were for that one, but alas, um, the VOD for that one will come up on Monday if somebody wants to fact check me. It's a shame. It's a damn shame. So that was our larceny old fashioned. We had a mellow corn old fashioned. We have a larceny old fashioned going from 90% corn down to 68% corn. There are other things between these bottles that make them different this is by no means a perfect comparison of what it's like to have more percentage of corn in your cocktail it really doesn't apply that way which it but it's the closest that i can come up with and i had the the excuse to be able to try all of these different corn-based spirits grain-based spirits all next to each other which i don't think i've ever done before so i'm very clearly benefiting from this more than awesome also says, OGD, or oh, granddad, and written will swing in the other direction real fast. Oh, for sure. I distinctly remember, although I can't remember the tasting notes, old granddad, very different from these two. It was a completely different spectrum. And of course, the written house is, it's right. There's not, a, there, there's corn in there, but not nearly as much as the other ones. And uh, we're going to see how that goes. Our next old fashioned will be made with the old granddad, OGD, as it is colloquially referred to uh, at least, at least once. Again, same same third verse, same as the first, slightly different than the second, because I forgot the skirt on the sir on the second one. I'm gonna take a sugar cube. I'm going to pop it into my glass. And there are many, many different ways to old fashioned. You could use simple syrup. You could completely forego the orange peel. You could use a lemon peel. You could use cherries and whatnot. You can do whatever you want to. However, um, I don't remember where it was that I was reading my, um, my, I guess, the critique of the Old Fashioned for. If you're going to put vermouth in it, or if you're going to... Oh, oh, I think it might have been... It might have been Dave Arnold. If it's... If it's going to... Mm, take us back for a moment. If you're going to mash fruit, if you're going to muddle fruit into the bottom, just call it a different drink. It's not an Old Fashioned. So, so I believe it was Dave Arnold who said. And I guess it's me who said, if you're going to put vermouth in it, it's... It's the wrong drink, I think. Um, because I made that mistake more than once. One time, one of my very close friends came over, and she was like, I want an old-fashioned, and I made for her a Manhattan. She's like, man, this is really good. And I was like, wait, did I put vermouth in that? She was like, yeah, it tastes like it. I'm like, oh, man. I screwed it up, dude. And I did. But, uh, you know, on the path of learning, you have to make mistakes. If you don't not learn, you... If you don't not mistake, you never learn. You can't correct. I'm gonna go full cocktail mode on this one, full cocktail angle on this guy as I put the other liquid constituents in on the inside, adjust my angle a little bit. Please bear with me. I'm just glad that the other the other angle is working this time, because um, it wasn't working last time. On the X-rated bar stream, things were breaking. I made a couple of changes to the Discord bot, the thing that I believe was causing things to break itself. And lo and behold, I think we're I think we're good so far. So far, I think everything is working. I think the channel points are working. The switching of angles is working. I think the other commands are working. And I added some other tools to allow me to know where things break if they break. So let's see. We had our two dashes of Angostura bitters. We have our sugar cubes at the bottom. I got an ice thing in there. I'm adding two ounces of the whiskey of your choice. Work that body. Oh look, it didn't work. Oh, there it is. There it is! Oh my god, it worked this time! I'm so happy. 
Oh, hey, the bot works. Oh, hey, look at that. Two ounces, about 60 milliliters of, in this case, it's all branded. And it says I have to do some hand flicks. Well, unfortunately for y'all, if I do hand flicks, I can't mix cocktails. So there are 10 different exercises that can happen and they're all picked out by my dearest, uh, the PT, the PT in training, the SPT, the PT in training. And um, I'm always afraid about my hand flicks because I have two loose rings on one hand and if I flick in just the right way, not only is it pleasurable, but I, my rings go flying. Um, flicking completely different different ways. That's not it. That, that ain't it. That ain't it, dog. No, that's not it. That's not hand flicks. Wait. I'm getting berated by my dearest who's about to come upstairs. Can I at least stir my cocktail first? Can I? I'm, I'm stirring the cocktail. Yeah, just just keep on walking. Seven is heaven. One, two, three. Uh, flick. Swish and flick the shit out of your wand, Harry. This is just momentum. Oh, that's just momentum. Oh, I was doing it wrong. Yeah. Seven is heaven, baby. Seven minutes in heaven. Hand flicks. All right, show me how to do it again. So you just go forward. This. Yeah. This. Hand flicks. And when you keep your shoulder, like you keep your elbows up, it also starts oh, working I have your to, shoulders. Oh, I have to keep my elbows up? Oh, like? No. Like this. Not scapular. Scap Before scapular plane. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I'm not a, we're going back to the full screen. And it's going to teach me a thing or two. Wait, wait, come back. No, wait. Oh, I have to express the lemon peel while you're doing whatever it is you're doing. Um, um, orange peel. What I say? Lemon peel? That's wrong. And I also have to sit. Uh, uh. Eh. Oh, wait, where are you going? Are you going somewhere? No. Okay. Anna's got my jacket on for some reason. Oh, okay. Well, welcome back. Hello. Your dearest is my favorite. She's one of my favorites, too. <laughs> welcome back. All right. Okay. 45 degrees. 45 degree angle. 45. It's got to no, be like this, right? Sorry. 45 no. 45 degrees, degrees in this direction. Right? Like this? In like diagonal plane. Diagonal. No, no, no. Relax no, no, no. Relax, relax my shoulder. Relax shoulder. Okay. It's PT time, baby. Okay. It's PT time, baby. Put your hand out. Eh. Breathe it. Eh. That way eh. you get finger flexion. Flexion, baby. Finger flexion and wrist extension. Finger flexion and wrist extension. I'll extend your wrist. I'm going to have to go through your list of exercises and fix them because you don't remember any of them. How many should I do? Seven is heaven? Um, when do you get tired? I'm not tired yet. So, There's still so much. We haven't even gotten to the other, the actual cocktails, really. Well, what you want to do is for intensity-wise, you want to make it harder. So intensity-wise, you want a one rep max. I should really just find you rubber bands, and then you could do this with them on. This is beginning to hurt. Oh, actually, I feel the soreness now. Wow, oh, okay. cool. That's how many. <laughs> you should do a hundred. A hundred? <laughs> It's a lot of, that's a lot, man. That's a lot of them. I just realized how weird that looks out of context. Like this does not just look like hand flicks. This looks like. <laughs> you know how I used to do it? Oh my god. Like the dance therapy. Yeah. Wait. What? What? Open like the fast. Open fast. Close slow. Open, open fast. Close. Slow. Maybe this will make the picture easier. <laughs> open fast. <laughs> <laughs> the other way is to pull a, um, keep explaining. Open slow. Yes. Close fast. Open slow. Yeah. 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 That's actually the better yeah. one because a lot of people don't. This work is better on for extension. your body. Well, most of the time you're holding cups, so that's like the flexion. So that's already. Short. I hold cups. You know, speaking of holding cups, Ew. this old fashion of mine is diluting. I stirred it this time. It's the same as the first one. Oh, you should drink it then. I should, I should. Don't, don't drink, don't suck, sip. Sip, my dear. Sip? You're not gonna like this. No. You definitely shouldn't try this old fashioned. I don't like brandy. Is that whiskey? No, it's brandy. It's okay, you don't like brandy. That's, that's an off topic comment that you've just made. That's okay. Totally valid. Oh, it's whiskey. Do you oh, see? Oh, I hate that one more. <laughs> <laughs> there are. What? Two bourbons and two whiskeys on this on this bar, and she's like, I don't like brandy. Like, <laughs> that's fine. You don't have to like brandy. <laughs> I love it. I love I love my brandy was corn -based. I love my no. Not to my knowledge at least. But you said it was the US thing and it's brandy. Bourbon. US. Bourbon. Oh, bourbon. It's bourbon country, girl. Oh, I Sip. got the words wrong because it started with a B. Oh. Now tell them what it tastes like. Ah, whiskey, bourbon, <laughs> old fashions. Tastes like corn. Just kidding. This one really doesn't taste like corn all that much. 
<laughs> I also don't like brandy. This is a fair point. I actually kind of like brandy. The fruitier components are something that I've been able to pick up on a little bit more. That was my dearest, everybody. I, I love her very much. And she's becoming a physical therapist. And she's damn good at it so far. She physically therapies me every day. That's a lie, actually. I forget what the... All, in, in all honesty, I tell her, Anna, I'm hurting. She gives me exercises. I forget what those exercises are. I ask again two weeks later, and she's like, you haven't been doing your exercises? I was like, I forgot what they were, and I forgot to tell you that I forgot what they were, and I forgot to tell you that because I forgot that they were, because I forgot that I forgot. My knees are still kind of in pain. So this is the old granddad, old-fashioned. Comparatively... It has a... I need to figure out what my... I would say it has a spice akin to the mellow corn. Um, ah, that makes sense. Because it's got 27% rye in it. I was going to say, I was like, there is a spicy component here. Work that body again. LED inflections. Anna? I don't know what the LED inflection is. I think that's on my feetses. It's on my feetsies. Um, but this one, this one struck me as a little more spicy, a more rye. There is, for lack of a better term, a spice that is present on spirits that have a rye based them that just like, if you, if you taste it, it's, it's the distinction between when you don't taste it and when you do taste it, do you realize, ah, that's what's happening there. And I, I hope to goodness that this case, actually, before I finish with this segment, I want to make sure that I go back through and I specifically try the old grand, oh, I'm sorry, the larceny specifically because it's the only one here that doesn't have rye as a part of the mash bill. More than awesome says as Anna is standing off screen, correcting me as I'm one, trying to do my one LED across. inflections. One and across. So here, one and across. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then across the. Body. And then across my body. Okay, I'm doing that. Yes. I have resistance bands for my slightly torn meniscus, but also oh, forgot my exercises. Oh, meniscus. Slightly oh, torn meniscus. Tar. Oh, can you ask that There's question again? There's a lot again? of tears. There's a lot of tears in the meniscus. Yeah. Is it a horseshoe tear? Is it a straight tear? Is it a curved tear? Is it an S-shaped tear? I. I, I was attempting to come up with the exact opposite of every statement that she said, but she went too far. What was it? What was it? Hor Could you repeat those again? Horseshoe tear. Okay, opposite of horse is... I'm struggling already. <laughs> I don't know what the opposite of a horse is. Let's see. Land animal, fast. Sea animal, slow. Uh -uh, Clam. Let's go all the way Okay, the all the way across my body. Oh my god. There we go. There you go. Yeah? Yeah. All right, so instead of horseshoe, I'm going to say clam hat. Straight hair. Gay. C shape. Uh, let's see. X. Because X. C is the third letter in the alphabet, and X is the third from the last letter of the alphabet. What's S the next one? S shape. S shape? Oh. Uh, what's S upside down? It's still S. Shit. Um, um, Z shape? Z shape. Uh. Okay. How about a W? I think that, uh, I'm pretty sure, like, a full tear uh, is Oh also, my god. Oh, there's also deep, me, well, it's me. In, intrasubstance? Intrasubstance? Ooh. Intrasubstance? Or something? That's the type of tear. Intrasubstance or something? That might be the location. Hmm. Because there's the inner, the outer, and then the middle. It's just kind of bubblegummy now. If it's inter. I think I got that the other night. And he also popped and said, goat, boat, a unicorn. They're all non-horses, but they all have horse. They all have their four leg things. Come on, Annie. Here, right. It's relatively stable, except if more than awesome works out too hard, they can't walk up or downstairs. That makes sense. Mm. It's probably I also struggle matter. with going up and downstairs sometimes. That's probably in the white matter part. White matter? Not matter. No, look, That's in your brain. That's Ooh. not right. So, like, technically... PT us, dear. So, your meniscus is there as a cushion. Okay. So... Is that, like, a is that like a tension... Th a tendon, or... No? There's a little thing. Marker? Marker? There are many markers. This one's most visible on the screen. So, your knee... Hold on a second. I have to, like, build this. Keep doing what you're doing. Oh, I made the knee weird. Oh, whatever. This is the tibia. And then you have like a wedge here, and a wedge here, and those are like your menisci, and then you have like the top. I can't one. zoom in any farther, unfortunately. So That's what was this? So it's PT time. This is your meniscus. Your meniscus. Basically. Your meniscus tibia? are to protect yeah, tibia? That's your tibia and okay. that's your fibula. Why'd you put a little notch there? Oh, uh, that's just that's a that's a bony landmark. No, but I like it. Put the notch back. It's a rectangle. We like rectangles. It reminds you of Minecraft. It's the tibial uh And what's this tubercle. one? My femur? That's your femur. My femur. Correct. Is that up on top? What are these little bubbles? Uh, oh, that's just the edge of the... Oh, is my kneecap supposed to be in here? 
Well, your patella would go right here on top. Your patella tastes like Nutella. This is my kneecap, my patella. Okay, well, you just covered up my, my menisci. Sure, you're right. <laughs> they're kind of like little ramps. Basically, so they're like wedges. Interesting. So as you like stand, you would basically like you're putting pressure on them. So they protect your knees, your bones from like actually touching. So they're like oh, a nice Are they cartilage? Patch. Are they made of cartilage? No, cartilage is different. Oh, cartilage so what is, edges so what is the menisci made out of? Is it I do not so know. cushiony it's tissue? It's a tissue thing. <laughs> Tissues like I can look it back up. No, no, I, know. I can look it that back up. That was just up. a joke, actually. Uh, just a pun. No, cartilage would be on the outside of your bone, like here. Oh, so, is that the little bubbly part? Oh, I guess there's there. What do you call those little bony protrusions? Abscesses? Uh, typically condyles. Co condyle. Condyle. Interesting. That's a new term to me. Condyle. You know, or, and then no, I, I, I didn't take these classes. No, like I tell you about my TMJ issue, and I tell you the condyle is where it hurts. Uh, that's not the thermoclidomastoid. TMJ. I don't know what that is. Thermoclidomastoid. Stop laughing at me! It's funny! Go ahead, tell me something computer related. Coding. Yeah, haha, <laughs> <laughs> you think coding is computers. When you code, it means you die too. No. Like we have a patient who coded. Oops. Oh yeah. <laughs> Basically. Basically. I'm pretty sure. Physical therapy. Oh, one second. I want to say the. Bloody area is here. You and need then, red for the blood. Oh my god. No, don't use it the sharpie. It just means it's vascular. Oh my god. So that would heal itself automatically. I'm pretty sure mm, it might be the other way around. I don't actually remember. This guy is more like a patella. very specific, like athletic type thing, and I don't have a lot of knee issues. Oh my god, I just remember oh we're live. God. Holy shit. Um, boats don't have four legs. <laughs> True. That's a, there's a the cushioning. It's got some push, but not a lot of push. Suddenly, anatomy, meniscuses, photo, femur and tibia be like, oh no, what if we kissed behind the patella? <laughs> Yo, what if Actually, we... that would be arthritis. <laughs> Yo, what if we what if we kissed behind the... No. There's a second camera angle. They can still see us. There's a what? There's a second camera angle. Do you oh. see the other one? Look, 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 look. Wait, look, you look. moved There's the... the... See, look. There we are. There we are. There we are. There we are. Oh my god. I can point at myself and at the camera at the same time. This is hilarious. This is such an interesting angle. Look at that. That's great. Basically, they're shock absorbers. That's the Basically, point. they're shock absorbers. So if it doesn't heal completely... good stuff. They not... So they used to remove Menisci uh -huh. before they realized like it was kind of... If you remove it, you add more pressure to that area. It actually increases, I think, about 400 times fold if you remove like each section. So I think it was like 25%, 50%, and then like- Oh, are you still going? I'm so sorry. Oh, you're fine. Okay, I'm fine. I will, I will. How do I erase this shit? That's okay, we got, we got things. No, 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 don't erase the, don't erase the beautiful- I am erasing it. Tibia, femur, meniscus, patella, notch in between, tastes like Nutella. It's beautiful. That's PT, baby. That's biology, dude. Oh, oh no, no, why'd you get rid of it? You don't need it. There's corn in your cocktails. There's corn in your patellas. There's no corn. Come here, let me put corn in your patellas. Or something. No, okay, okay, whoa. I'm gonna go watch. I think I might have show. breached a boundary. Okay, bye. Bye bye. Go watch Sasuke. Sasuke. Bro, you're watching Sasuke and Miano again without me? Yeah! I love that show. <laughs> it's a really good show. I started show. watching it last night. Oh my god. It's so cute! It's a really good show. It's so much better than all that other heterogeneous shit. <laughs> heterosexual <laughs> shit. I don't know, they don't make good romances anymore. I give up. Welcome to my house. I live with Anna. It's great. Thank you, Annie. No, thank you, Annie. And thank Anna. Oh, we were there. I forget. There's two Annas in chat right now. Yeah, my work's unless I overdo the niece is more than awesome. So I'm not doing anything until it's a full tear. That's probably a fair thing. Relax yourself. Rice Cerrone says, did I walk into an ad for the knee center? Patella. Tastes like Nutella. Knee center? Knee center? Center of the knee? Get it? Center of the knee? Well, it's, it's gone now, but in any case, the hell are we doing? Tasting old fashions. Duh. So I think I made I made a small I made a small comment on it, and I was saying that the the old granddad has a spice to it. It's indicative of the rye. I got that because I also tasted it in the in the mellow corn. I tasted it more so. It was a lot more potent, but despite the fact, it was still there, still prevalent. It was also almost like bubble gummy. There was a bit of a sweetness there that I actually really appreciated in the old granddad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was saying, and that was good, but I also didn't swallow the whiskey yet, so I made a small mess. 
So for someone who joined late, what's up with the old fashioned? I will answer that in a moment. Also, Rittenhouse will make a better Manhattan than an old fashioned. It's true. We're testing new corn blend impacts on old fashioned. So the concept of what you see, if y'all would shut up for a moment, or if I would turn off, if, if I would take chat and put it elsewhere, that's something I'm currently working on. It's just tough to find the right place for chat where I can still poke it and stuff. There's corn in your cocktails, naturally. Surprise, bourbon, just to give a quick rundown, bourbon must be at least 51% corn uh, by mash. We have a couple different bourbons here, a couple different corn whiskeys here. We went over some laws in the very beginning to determine what is bourbon, what's not bourbon, what's bottled in bond, what's high rye, what's high weed, what's otherwise aging and proofs and stuff. So we went through that. The historical stuff is behind us, and I'm glad it is, because history is not my favorite subject. So what I want to do was take all these different whiskeys, there is a whiskey, there's a bourbon, there's a bourbon, there's a whiskey with varying different percentages of corn. We have mellow corn coming in at 90%, and larceny coming in at 68%, old granddad coming in at 63%, and Rittenhouse rye coming in at 37% of corn by mash volume. And I kind of wanted to see, because they all have corn in them, how they all taste in old fashions. Because one, I haven't had old fashioned in a hot minute. Two, I've wanted an excuse to try these ones all next to each other, and it seemed like the right way to do so. And three, Okay, boomer. It was the it was the thing that I would insert there. It's been pretty good. We're tasting testing exactly where we needed to be. No moving chat. Exactly. No. So corn alcohol plus what makes old fashioned? To make your old fashioned, there are many different ways to play. But essentially, what you do need is you will need some sort of whiskey. It could be whiskey, bourbon, otherwise scotch. I guess if you wanted to, you add some bitters, two dashes of Angostura, two ounces of that whiskey, whatever. You add some sort of sweetener. You can add a sugar cube, which is what I've been using. You can add simple syrup if you want to. I don't remember. What the ratio is on that it varies wildly and then you also add some sort of diluting agent probably your you, i guess you could do cool water if you wanted to a little bit or an ice stir that around and then express a you can express an orange pill on it you can put a lemon peel on it you can just put a cherry on it there are so many different ways to old-fashioned if you according to at least one author if you muddle fruit like you take an orange slice you just go to town on it it's not an old-fashioned call it something else or if you add vermouth into it you probably made it a manhattan by mistake and you've been lying to all of your friends, which I did at least on one occasion. I hope that covered things for you. So we have made old fashions with the mellow corn, larceny, and old granddad so far. Summarizing as of now, there is a poignant flavor that all I can describe is spice. It's hot. It hurts almost. Spice almost like a chili spice that is present in this old fashioned and this old fashioned because these two, having 90% and 63% of corn, also have 10 ish percent and 27% of rye, a different type of grain. And that rye flavor is prevalent. It's prevalent in the spirit and it's also very prevalent in the old fashioned because it's a little bit diluted and you can really get those notes a little bit more. There's probably some other crazy stuff going on, but my palate just. My palate is tired, man. And also, I'm not that good at whiskey tasting anyway. We'll see where I am in a year from now, because this shit ain't stopping. And he says, do you know that from the first old fashioned we were, cur we were cursed? Did you know that from the first old fashioned we were cursed? We were cursed? Cursed with what? Cursed with what, I say? I don't really know. I, I didn't get that reference. We got that. In any case, there is one more. Oh, that's a Taylor, oh, that's a Taylor Swift reference. Oh, from the song Getaway Car. I didn't forget about the Taylor Swift cocktails. I haven't forgotten yet. I just I just didn't specifically plan for it this month. Maybe something. Actually, when's Taylor Swift's birthday? We'll take note of that. We, we will. We most certainly will. So, the next thing that we're going to do is these are not these these are the corn ones that I wanted to cover, but I decided to add the the the, um, the Rittenhouse rye in there as well because it does actually have 37% of corn in there, 51% rye. It's probably why you can call it rye whiskey that 51% is like the mark there. Uh, it's fundamentally different. But I wanted to try it anyway. So that was what we we're gonna do. December 13th. December is her birth month. That's a good note to make. Excuse me while I make a note to myself. T Swift. December 13th. Is it actually December 13th? That's awesome. I love that number. 13 is a magical number in my life, and December is a pretty nice month. It's after my birth month. So Fourth verse, same as the first, the sort of the second and the third. We're going to make an old fashioned with Rittenhouse Rye as well and see how it all compares. And then we're going to go back through. We're going to do a bit of tasting and stuff. And that's what it's all about. So what are we going to need to do? I need a sugar cube. I need to stop. I was going to say, I need to stop being my bubbly self, but that just ain't happening. Sorry, guys. Then we need to add some sort of diluting agent. I'm going to grab my spherical ice cubes. 
they're sort of kind of spherical. Um, so I'm going to make them as, un, as as more spherical as possible. This one kind of looks like a magic saucer, so I'm just going to kind of... Oh, that actually landed in one of my glasses. I'm going to do it in the other direction. A little extra dilution never hurt anybody. And yeah, 13. Oh my god, the corn drawing has a face. Hell yeah, it does, and it's looking at you. And 13 is her favorite number. Ha, I would understand why. I dropped my ice cube on top of my sugar cube. I'm sorry, I dropped my ice ball on top of my sugar cube. Um, I'm gonna throw my extra ice into my Brita filter because it just, just makes sense, yeah? It totally makes sense. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna add two, and only two, dashes of Angostura bitters. You could probably also sw swap out the bitters too. Oh, I got a lot of that bitters on my bar, so actually a little bit, okay, cool. Just a little bit more. I made a little bit of a boo-boo. Let me clean that up real quick. I don't know if that's gonna stain. I don't want my bar to be stained. Um, I don't know else I was going with that. I lost my train of thought. That's okay. 13 is a favorite number. Yay, November birthday, buddies. Love that. I love November. I like I like fall. I liked fall for a while, and then I realized fall's too damn cold. So now I know I'm not a big fan of fall anymore. I like spring. It's warm. The birds are singing. The sun is shining, and it rains a shit ton. Um, but that just means I get to stay inside. It's great. Ango stains a lot. Yeah, so I, I'm glad I cleaned that up a little bit. Actually, I just noticed I have a. Well, this bar needs to be restained, revarnished. Add, add, add infinitum. It really does. All right, so I added my two uh, my two dashes of the Ango. I'm gonna add two ounces of the Spirit of Choice. In this case, it is going to be the Rittenhouse Rye. Two ounces, or about 60 milliliters. I need to clean out. I need to wash out my measuring jigger a little bit. Yep, that's good. And then we'll pop two more ounces in there. 60 milliliters for those who live across the pond. Or if you're using a metric jigger, it's probably around 50 milliliters. But don't worry. Just take the big side of the jigger and fill it up. And then you will have the more or less ratioed equivalent of what I am referring to here. I have very odd angles here, so please excuse me as I... There we go. That worked out well. I'll put that to the side because I don't think we're, we're, not, we're not making any more old fashions. We got, we got bigger fish to fry and the blender's making an appearance this evening. That's actually next. The blender comes next. Oh my God, you guys are going to love this. This would be great. This is the first time I've had the blender and the new cocktail angle. So that means maybe we can look at the blender. We're definitely going to look at the blender. So the next thing that we're going to need to do is we're going to need to stir it. We need to give it a slight dilution. They say that seven is heaven. At least one person said eight. No more than eight. Don't do more than eight. Don't do it. Um, I'm not even counting at all. I'm just doing whatever I want to. I'm staring at the camera. Potentially awkwardly? Hey. Howdy. How you doing? Disney Queen says... I must correct my meniscus statement. The vascular portion is on the lateral outside region of, so that part typically can heal itself. And if it's an incomplete tear, it's less likely to get stuck. If the meniscus tears and starts flipping around, then they remove it. If not, the meniscus tears shouldn't affect your life unless you are an extremely high level athlete or have increased weight in your upper body. Okay, now Anna watches her show. Thank you for the swift correction of yourself. We appreciate that around here. Don't count, make it cold, it'll be great. Make it cold, make it cold, make it freezing. Freeze my nuptials. I don't remember what nuptials are. Oh, and we also need, in this case, we're gonna peel. We're gonna grab an orange peel. Again, trying to get that perfect technique where I don't get much peel. Actually, let's let's put that on the main main screen just so we can watch me potentially not do super well with my peeling technique. It's all about practice. Also, I am definitely wearing pants. They're jeans this time, and I got it tucked in because I'm a farmer man. Let's try to see. How can I? Let's see if I can get a, a reasonable amount of pith, or or rather, the lack thereof. All right, and so, Ooh. oh man, that's not bad at all. There's not a lot of pith on there at all, my God. Some would say that we're improving around here. All right for pants, indeed. Country man, with this much corn, country girls make do. <laughs> that's in reference to, a, to an image that implies that the woman masturbated using a corn cob she found in the field, because the corn itself is literally dripping. And um, that, that haunted me throughout most of high school, that image. In any case, I don't have a, I can ha it can have a cute flare up, says the meniscus, and a, oh my God. Oh my god. I'm a small boy. I just can't go for go bowl from four hours unless the knee hurts. It can have acute flare-ups, the meniscus in this case, but that's normal. It's normal. Apparently, you're totally normal. And I don't know if that's a good thing. I don't know. If you call somebody normal, some people would take that as, a, as an insult, to be honest. If somebody said, you're totally normal, I'd be like, 
I am? Statistically speaking, I think that's incorrect. Rittenhouse rye, old-fashioned. It smells like... Who known? Oh, wow. Howdy. Oranges. I expressed an orange peel over the top of it. Of course it's gonna smell like oranges. How does it taste, though? Yeah, that is completely different. Wow. So, when I'm drinking the Rittenhouse rye old-fashioned, again, I've said it already, that the rye is spicy. It burns. Not only is this burning because this is also a bottled and bond bottle, it has 100 proof. It is 50% alcohol, which means by volume, this particular old fashioned is more proofy than let's say the Larceny, which is only 92 proof. Also, it's over 50% rye. It has a poignant, in your face flavor that pairs really well with the orange taste, if I may be so bold there. I will also say as well, what winds up happening when you stir this, when you let it sit for a little while, there is some sugar at the bottom here. If you like your old fashions more sweet, then naturally the sugar crystals are not gonna, they're not gonna combine the same way as you would if you used syrup. So you could just add syrup in place of the, the sugar cube. You don't have to do it this way. You could technically too, take your orange peel, muddle it into the sugar cubes and create almost like a, a pre oleo saccharum where the sugars actually rip the oils out of the peel itself and also kind of make the syrup right in the glass. That's a technique too. There are many different ways to old fashions. And to be fair, if anybody tells you that there is a wrong way to old fashion, um, so long as the recipe stays the same, they, they might just they might just be people that you don't want in your life, it seems. Oh my gosh. I appreciate being normal, says more than awesome. I get that. Which one is your favorite? So, if I had to pick a favorite so far. What I actually want to do is now that we've done this little comparison here, what I want to do is I'm going to go back through each of them. Now, the amount of time, this is not very scientific, guys. The amount of time that I have spent in particular, in between the old gra granddad in the written house is inconsistent. If we were trying to do this the more scientific way, we wouldn't be doing it this way. This is more or less just a just a means to just a means to just just try out the different whiskeys and stuff to see how they compare to each other. These ones are going to be significantly more diluted. Actually, I think the ice is more or less completely gone in most of these ones here, and the ice has barely just gotten started over there. So we'll see how much time that I can. I can stall on the first three, going back through them and comparing them, and then we'll see how the last one tastes, and then I'll give you an idea of which one's my favorite so far. And you would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for, if it weren't for you muddling bartenders. That's a good one. Give, give little Abe my regards. That pun was on point. Partner. Anyways, so. What was the whole point of this? What, what was the point of the whole old-fashioned thing? The whole point was to see if we go down the line, highest percentage of corn to lowest percentage of corn, whether or not we would get a significant difference. Caveats here. If this were supposed to be like a research paper, here are the disclaimers up at the top. It's not just corn. It's not just corn, rye, and malted barley. It's corn, it's, it's corn, rye, malted barley, corn, wheat, malted barley, corn, rye, malted barley, and rye, corn, malted, malted barley. There are so many other factors here that go into what the old fashioned or what your whiskey bourbon drink is going to taste like in the end. This is not a proper comparison. This is not a science channel. At least not as it is right now. So this is more or less just a comparison of the whiskeys that I have in my collection for. If you are also a home bartender, somebody who just drinks just because, just because it's what you have in your home and you're going to use whatever you have, you can use whatever you have. That's totally fine. But if you're somebody who has a couple more bottles, let's say you've gone to the store and you're not going to drink all this whiskey and bourbon, but you want to know which one works best in certain cocktails, a comparison like this will serve you well because you can pick out like if you have four or five bourbons whiskeys to choose from you can be like well i know if i'm mixing it with sugar cube a little bit of ice and angostura bitters and stirring it and with an orange peel over top i think i might like this one over the other one and that's good for you maybe not for the world at large but if you can make put a little more pot like a little more consistency in your life to know what you like this is the sort of exploration that you can do and you can do it with any cocktail i think in particular in my life when i've compared rums because the last time the last time i really did an in-depth like analysis of spirits in particular cocktails i went through rums i tested the various different types of dark rums that i had dark slash colored rums like a um like gold i'm just going to describe by color golden rum dark rum light rum versus a more aged rum like a plantation or a like um like a 
trying to think of the other rums that I had down here, like a spiced rum, like a Captain Morgan. I did a rum and coke, just a little bit of rum, a bit of coke, and I tried them all in the same proportion. That was a really, really good way to deter to allow me to figure out which one I like best. And personally, I like a more complex rum and coke. I really like rum and cokes that are made with an aged rum. Specifically, the one that I had at the time was a plantation three star based off of recommendations I found on the internet, but yours could be different. I had a friend who I was also testing things with, and she was really, really into the dark rum rum and cokes, like a Kraken or a uh, Myers. Um, there are other folks out there who I think would probably swear by the Captain Morgan, the spice rum. And all I want to say is, if you think Captain Morgan's spice rum is good, what if I tell you you can make your own spice rum with your own botanicals and stuff? Crazy. And it'll probably taste better too. In any case, I less, uh, less I digress about rum, but more on all of these. So, going back to mellow corn, I think originally what I thought, let me take a sip of water first. Slow myself down, prepare my palate a little bit more. As I go through these, I think, if I remember, my tasting notes for the mellow corn were a bit more, a bit more, it was bright. Bright in the sense that it was kind of spicy. That was the rye in there. There was another, there was, uh, I think that's mostly what I got from it. Was, it was vegetal, it was bright, it was spicy. The larceny old fashioned was corny. It actually kind of tasted like corn. It's not as, it's not as bitey. There is no rye in this mash bill. It's also a less less alcoholic than the other ones as well. It's only 92 proof as opposed to the 100 proof of the bottled and bonds over here. So that was a little more corny, more vegetal than the mellow corn, and also more pleasant, a little more on the sweeter side. The old granddad was a fundamentally different taste of old fashioned. I don't think I got really anything vegetal there. Nothing, nothing vegetal in terms of like, let's say like a, like, um, like a bitterness, but more a, um, more a earthiness, like a more deeper minerally tone. Um, but there was a sweetness there too, that reminded me a lot of, I think a little bit of like the sweetness that you get from like, I want to say cotton candy, but what I'm probably referring to is cane sugar. It's almost, almost cane sugary specifically, or maybe like white sugar. I don't really know. I haven't fancied the sugars very much. And then we had the Rittenhouse rye old fashioned, which was bitey. It had a flavor that was complete. It didn't taste like corn. It didn't take, taste like the earth. It didn't taste like a vegetable. It tasted almost fruity in a way. It had more. It had more of the not not the sweet parts of a fruit, but more the more the I guess more off putting sides of the fruit. Like let's say like uh, actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna taste it because it's been sitting for a little bit longer and I wanna make sure I'm spitting this properly. The spice, the spice is most prominent, but I'm also getting there is almost, oh, actually now it's almost a nuttiness. There's almost a tinge of like, you could, you could say that there was a drop of like amaretto or something in there. It's like, um, but nut, nutty, not like the nut itself, but like if you've ever like cracked an almond and you've smelled the smell of cracking the almond, specifically the shell itself, it's almost like the taste that I'm experiencing is similar to the smell of cracking an almond. Don't know where that came from, but it's familiar to me. Anyways. This is correct with with respect to the written. I'm so glad. I love validation. Mellow corn, though, going back to it. This has been sitting for quite a while now. The ice sphere has more or less, it's down to like a little ice pebble right now. Actually, you know what? I don't know why I'm just looking at it like this. Take a look for yourself. This is what we got right now. This is the actually better angles. Hi there, it's my face. This is what it's looking right, like right now. The ice cube is pretty much gone. You can see a little bit of it that back there. It's gotten a little more cloudy. It's really chilled a lot more. And um, as, it, as it stands now, as I'm swishing this around, I'm actually doing myself a little bit of a favor. I would think overall with the way that I constructed these old fashions, I would like them to be a little more sweet. And there is a sugar cube in every single one of these. And I noticed that in these ones that have been sitting for a little while, the sugar cube is more or less gone. It's been completely dissolved. And if I stir it around a little bit more, as you would as you are chatting with your cronies and sipping on your drink because this is one that's meant to be sipped the sugar will slowly but surely incorporate into the rest of the drink evolving it over time making it a little more sweet so i'm wondering if this is going to be the sweetness that i expect from it yeah it's a lot less bitey now it is it is a lot more diluted note it is more i can taste more of like a almost a fruity note in there uh, and that might be coming from like the the sugar. I don't remember what kind of sugar I used for the sugar cubes. It's like a brownish sugar. Um, it's definitely more pleasant now. And I think it's because the water has had an effect on it. The dilution has had an effect on it. The rest of the sugar incorporating within also had an effect on it. Also too, I have an orange peel in there. And the orange peel is slowly but surely releasing the rest of its essences into the drink itself as it sits there. 
this is a little more of a pithy peel so it might be if there's a i don't think it's lending too much of a bitterness but if your palate is particular you might notice a little more of a bitter bite with this particular peel that had more pith on it they was they say the way we'll do old fashioned says more than awesome is a little more sugar because your cubes were tiny and maybe a little more water or whatever i would agree with that the sugar cubes that i made were, i don't have the mold up here i'm still trying to work on a better sugar cube method i think the equivalent of my sugar cubes they're kind of they're like you did this big like less like the size of my pupil i guess and uh, you could probably add more depending on your sweetness level but again sure like sugar itself can only have like it, it needs to dilute i guess it needs to needs to dissolve into something and i don't exactly know I, I don't remember what the molecule of alcohol looks like but and i don't really know what the out with the molecule for sugar looks like either uh, but likes dissolve likes and i guess water yeah i guess water and alcohol combine it's not like they're like oil and water. So yeah, I guess it would work. Yeah, sugar would dissolve in a little bit of alcohol. How much though? I don't know. That's another question for the chemists. In any case. The mellow corn one. A lot more mellow. I am getting... Oh, actually, there was something interesting about that. It was when I was breathing out. I got something different. It was almost like, so I, I, I breathed out, I had, I, I tasted a different note, and the thing that I tasted, the thing that I thought I tasted, and it might have been because I was staring at the corn cob, was almost like the hair of the corn. I think I did get the more corny notes, now that it's sat around for a little bit longer. Again, another thing that'll happen with whiskey's and bourbons is when you add water to it, the whiskey blooms. There's flavor components, flavanols, phenols, maybe, I could be misquoting that, that unleash after you add a little bit of dilution you add a little bit of water to it and i think i'm getting a lot more of the corn vibes now with the mellow corn after it sat for a little while uh versus when we first had it which was more i tasted more of the rye there's also malted barley in here too i don't know what malted barley tastes like so i'm not going to dwell on that for uh, very long so in the beginning it tasted more of the rye as it dilutes over time it tastes more like the corn a little more sweet a little more pleasant i think in my opinion so so far I like the mellow corn old-fashioned more so now than I did at the very beginning, which if I continued to sip on it, I would have been pleasantly surprised about. The Larceny old-fashioned, which has corn, wheat, malted barley, percentages in that order. This one has no rye. There shouldn't be a bite to it. Not in the same way, at least. And that's absolutely true. There is so much more of a corn flavor coming from the larceny. Now, it is really, really obvious that there is corn in here. It's shocking to me because this is 90% corn and this is 68% corn. This has more corn in it by volume than the larceny does, but yet this tastes so much more like corn. And when I say corn, I mean like, it's almost like I just took a bite of this corn cob, which I've been doing every once in a while because it tastes damn good, and then sipped the cocktail. But I took a bite of the corn a while ago. I had the rye in between there. I had a few sips of water. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the larceny. The larceny tastes like corn and it's really nice too. It's nicely diluted. It's, it's good. And I can still smell like uh, another thing too. I can still smell like the orange, the, the orange oils from all of these. And I don't think the orange expression, the expression of the orange sits unpleasantly in any of these drinks. Makes sense. Yeah, it tastes like corn my god it tastes like corn with a little bit of, a little bit of something else in there i'd say a little more of a there's something bitter about it something something grassy grassy and maybe woody that's all right that's actually I, I do like that when i so the, the the flavor on my tongue right now as i do this it's almost like i've been into the corn like completely for the larceny so this is this is corn maybe i don't know why i keep saying baby I don't mean to do that. Just a, just a verbal tick that I've fallen into. This is the old granddad one. It's, um, the ice cube is actually almost, the ice sphere is almost gone in this one, honestly. That's actually quite surprising. This one kind of smells like candy right now. Hmm. Kind of tastes like a marker. That's okay. It's, it's almost like um, it, it, there's almost something. I don't. I don't want to call it chemical because chemical just feels vague and negative as a term to use. But there's almost something like chemical about that. 
There's a sweetness. Previously, I was almost getting like, like almost like sugary notes, but now it's kind of less so on the old granddad. Previously, like I got, a, I got an interesting history with old granddad. I used to not like it very much. It was like the whiskey that I would see all the time at my fraternity house for the most part. Um, that and Maker's Mark naturally if it was on the higher side that or if it's on the cheaper side which was more so than the other ones it was gonna be like bankers club i think but this is like i'm trying to find more aspects of it that i enjoy but like it's just okay like so it has the bite of the rye it has the bite of the rye just like the mellow corn does but now that it's diluted over time it's it's still more right this has more than twice the percentage of rye than the mellow corn does, but it's overpowering. It's just, it's too, it's too rye for me. The old granddad is in this particular combo here. It probably need, it probably needs more sweetness. I think I'd probably enjoy it a little bit more there. And then finally, go back to the Rittenhouse. We just had a chance to dilute a little bit more. Not, not as much as the other ones, but alas, we gotta, we got other things planned for this evening, so I gotta move on. Yeah, like, even the Rittenhouse rye has that rye bite, obviously, but, but there's, but there's other flavors that I can taste there. I, I do, I do get the, like, almost nutty, almost fruity notes there, and, like, I don't really get any of that from the old granddad, so, yeah, that's, that's my thoughts on that. If I had to pick a favorite out of all of these, I was really, really blown away by the fact that the Larceny tastes like corn, and I really like the taste of corn. However, I was even more surprised by the transformation of the mellow corn old fashioned because it went from tasting like something that was a little more like powerfully rye to something that tasted like corn as well. So the loveliness of the corn that I get from the larceny, I'm also getting from the corn from the mellow corn. But what I'm getting too is this evolution, a different dimension to it that I wasn't even expecting because of the way that it's diluted over time and kind of come to temperature. It's possible that because it's the first one, it's been sitting for the longest, it is the warmest. That's why I like it more. But um you could we could list a number of different reasons of why it might i might prefer one over the other um but i think the mellow corn the mellow corn old fashioned has is my favorite i like that i would say in order though i like the mellow corn old fashioned i like the larceny old fashioned the rittenhouse old fashioned and then the old granddad old fashioned and that would be my that would be my order so let's see if we do that um yeah like that that's my it's my final my final order please don't drop your glasses can that would be terrible please don't do that Thank you. Ta-da, we did it. And that was all of our old fashions. My goodness, we are... God damn, we got an hour and a half into this. I spent all this time at bourbon. I'll be honest, I thought that I was going to not have enough material to take up a lot of time on bourbon, but when you got Plentiful Company, Spryful Company, and you have four different bottles to get through at the same cocktail, it takes a little while on it. Hopefully we learn something and we'll move on. Again, the theme, the theme of this here ranch is the fact that there's corn in your cocktails and you might be asking yourself oh corn my cocktail of course i've heard of bourbon before i've heard of whiskey before i like those grain spirits those ones are fine but could, did you also know that you can also just use corn in general you don't even have the grain you don't even have to distill it you can do other things with your corn to put the corn in your cocktails and so we're going to move on to the next segment this was a good hour and a half i'm so curious about your corn rum corn butter rum thing Oh baby, oh baby, we do. Just uh, let me let me give a moment, just to uh, put these put these whiskeys away and clean things up just a little bit. It's actually not too much cleanup that I have to do over here. This is, this is I just put them. They're all they're all the same spirit, so they all go into the same corner of the bar. Um, the cocktail angle that the uh, the other angle doesn't go as far back here as I'd like it to. Otherwise, I'd love to just like show. Like you, you guys can't see it right now. I can post a picture of people who are really curious, but like all of my bottles are behind the bar. I can go down and get anything. You want you want Chambord? I got it. We got Chambord. You want something that tastes like absinthe? We got that. It's over here. Jaeger's over near the absinthe. We got spicy spirits and stuff. Oh my god, we got everything back here. It's it's awesome. When I when I pondered for myself what I wanted out of a bar to continue to make the bar with an X better than it could possibly be, I was like, I just need a space to keep things. It'd be great if it was right back here. It's a shame that like, you know, I don't have like the same 
spirits set up behind me as most bars do. You can't really see what you could possibly order. And one of the things that I want to do is at some point, I really want to make a like a public facing document that says what is behind this bar so that the people who are at the bar, the patrons, the regulars know what there is on the menu. And um, I'm working on that. So we, we move on, but we have digressed. I mean, your blackboard is kind of incredible. This was this was literally a random idea that I had at 11.30 p.m. right as I was going to bed. I was like, Anna, what if I put a chalkboard on the wall? She's like, you can't put a chalkboard on it. I was like, I think I can put a chalkboard on the wall. I did it, and it was wonderful. Also, the regulars will know which bottles you have. This is true. They are more, more, well, more or less, the wonderful thing about spirits is spirits do wonderful things. You put them under your bar, and they stick around, and they stay okay, because they got a lot of alcohol in them, and no bacteria and stuff. They don't really go bad. The cream liqueurs can be a little little touchy. They'll, like, curdle and stuff after a while. And to be fair, I have this bottle of Godiva chocolate liqueur that's been sitting outside of my fridge for too long. But in any case, we move on. Cocktail time. In any case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these other old fashions. I'm going to kind of put them off to the side. Probably going to put them... What is the best place to put these things? I don't really know. I will keep... Which one Which one stays with the bartender? I'm going to keep the larceny one. I just want to taste more corn. This one's all about corn. So I'm going to take the most corn forward one. And I'm going to keep that with me. Put that in a coaster. Like coasted around here. And I guess I could coast just for the other ones. Because they'll, they'll stick around. It's a testament to where we've been. Also, every time I go to a bar now and I get like coasters and stuff, I bring it back with me. So let's see. We got one from Hokkaido Brewing. We got one from Thirsty Dice. We got one from Heroes of Arcadia. This one was Unity IPA and Love City Brewing Co. And then this one is literally just a, a tile. This is just a ceramic tire, tile with some, some cork on the bottom of it. It's great. I'll put these guys back here behind the corn in preference order. One will be hidden. No, maybe one won't be hidden. Let me, let me, re let me do some changing rearranging what it's all about there we go all the old fashions are gonna be sitting back here oh as soon as you said the wonderful thing about i blacked out for a moment while i followed the tigger song it's true i love <laughs> the one i just i'm glad you caught that I'm very glad that you did Anna. i think anna really really likes winnie the pooh i really like winnie the pooh and uh at one point i want to do a good winnie the pooh impression i don't know how to do a winnie the pooh impression right now honey Something, something about the honey or something. I don't know. It's it's weird for now. Kind of sounds like a gorilla. In any case, so the next part of there's corn in your cocktails. There's corn in your cocktails is something called chicha. Chicha is it? Wait, wait, wait. Actually, let me let me update my board first. Don't move too far ahead of yourself, Cam. Update the topic. We're not on the next segment yet. Hold your horses. Old fashioned. It was nice, but it's old. It's old fashioned. We gotta move on to something new, something exciting. Honestly, I don't know if chicha is new or exciting, um, but we're doing it anyways. It's gonna be great. So this is chicha. And we'll, and then there's other parts that go along with it. So the next second that we have here, the next, the next part is about chicha. Chicha, if my if my research on Google serves me correctly, is a Spanish or might be Portuguese phrase that roughly translates to, I'm looking at my board for reference, I think it almost roughly translates to either girl or meat or flesh. And chicha is usually used in a recipe called chicha morada, a play on a sort of Spanish term, if you will, that roughly translates to like the purple flesh or the purple meat, or I guess the purple girl. And essentially the way that you make chicha morada is you take the, the purple corn Corn, the, the maize, I believe is the way that you pronounce it. Uh, I remember learning about maize specifically because in, back in New Jersey, the Lenin and Lenape Native Americans um, were very, very, they were very, very passionate about their maize, their corn, the kind of, I don't know if it's like a predecessor to corn or otherwise, that's for the, the biologists, I guess. But the, oh, this one says, uh, my recipe here also says it's also Peruvian, so Peru, from Peru as well. But the chicha morada takes your purple corn on the cob, you put it in water, do a little bit of a boil, you are essentially leaching out the components, you're doing a bit of infusion, it's almost kind of like a syrup, because you add some sugar, you add other spices and stuff to it, and you get this infusion that has a very, very dark purple, almost reddish color. I have a picture on my phone screen here that I'll showcase for reference. I... Uh, we'll, we'll get to it. This is what 
at least according to the internet, the Chicha Morada would look like. There is a sort of redding that you can see at the top. There's a very, very dark coloring. And you can see fruit floating at the top of it because your Chicha Morada would almost kind of be like a sangria in the sense that you do your infusion process. You let your purple corn sit in the water. You add your sugar. You get it up to a boil. You let it sit for a while. And then you add other things to it. You can let chicha ferment. You can make it into a fermented beverage. It's got the sugars and whatnot from the corn in there. So just like any other things, you can add a little bit of yeast or let it sit out and let the wild yeast do its job and it will eventually ferment. And it is a, a beverage that is enjoyed, at least according to this document in Peru, I've seen other places as well because the world is not just countries, it's a world naturally. Unfortunately, in the time it took for me to decide Corn will be the theme this week, which was on Monday. I wasn't able to find purple corn, which I was very disappointed about. It's not in season over here. We are, we're in March right now. We're in the very, very beginning of March. It is March 1st, 2023 at the time of this stream here. And I wasn't able to find purple corn, unfortunately. However, I was able to find regular corn, as can be seen very clearly here. Corn stalks that was picked up by my friend at Reading Terminal Market today. And you can, uh, technically speaking, if you imagine for a moment that the, the, piece of the chicha morada that is the purple corn is the chicha. If you take the chicha morada and you don't use the morada, you don't use the purple stuff, you use some other stuff, you may find yourself in a similar position to where I am, where, at least according to feastmagazine.com, you can create a recipe called chicha andina. And andina, I believe, roughly translates to Andean, as in Andes, like the Andes Mountains, which I don't remember where they are. Alexa, where are the Andes Mountains located? The mountains of the Candy Cane Mountains run through Azerbaijan. Candy Cane Mountain? No. Alexa, where are the Andes Mountains? The mountains of the Andes run through Argentina. Argentina. Bolivia, Chile, Colombia. South America. The Peru southernmost Peru tips of... Oh, Peru! Peru! Miles. Peru is on there too. So, per, uh, again, so I uh, I just learned today that Peru is apparently in South America. I'm not very geographically inclined, but Chicha Andina of the Andes Mountain is named in such a way that it preserves the geographical origins while nixing on the Morada because it's not purple. It's yellow corn instead. And so that's what we're going to do. The recipe that I have here is actually a cocktail. You could, you could just do what I'm about to do, creating corn milk and just drink it. You can probably combine it with other things. You can add cinnamon syrup to it, pineapple juice and various other things we will go through the recipe here but the first thing that you're going to need to do is you're going to need to make corn milk corn milk can be created as such you take the kernels from an ear of corn you remove the kernels put some water into it and put it into a blender and then strain it out essentially we're juicing some corn we're making some corn juice over here which uh i've honestly been meaning to find an excuse to bring the blender out and so we're gonna get the blender out, but not yet. We actually need to get the corn off of the thing for, actually, you know what? No, 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 we're gonna get the corn off of it and just put it right into the blender. This is Anna's blender. She lets me use it because I use it and really don't ask permission. Oh, it's it's a little wet in there. That's alarming. That's okay. It's, pr a little, it's probably okay. Yeah, that's got like, that blender's been sitting around for a while now. That water is very old. I don't like that, but it's not in, it's not on the inside. Also, please note, I stuck my hand in the blender. This is unplugged. Do not stick your hand in the plugged-in blender. Just to make that obvious, there's the plug. Here, you can see it. It's plugged into... No, it's not plugged into any, any one. I, I, it's great. It's great. In any case, we will move on. So, God, what was I doing? Oh, what was I doing over here? My head's all off in the space and stuff like that. We need to shuck the corn. That's what we gotta do. Naturally, if you're gonna make some messes on stream, gotta have a bucket. I got my bucket on standby. I'm gonna put the bucket here. I'm gonna shuck some corn. I literally have no idea what the proper method for shucking corn is, but I just know I need to take the the thing on here and take it off. Actually, you know what? This feels this feels appropriate for the cocktail angle. Observe, everybody. This is my bucket. I'm gonna showcase to you my bucket, and I'm also gonna showcase to you how to shuck corn into the bucket. Can I can I do that? Is that is that not awkward? We're gonna make it work. We're gonna make it work. There are so many different ways to play. I'm still getting used to this angle. There we go. Is that? Chucking corn. Chucking corn this evening. There we go. What a lovely sound that makes. There might be a technique to this. I don't really know what it is. In any case, as I'm shucking away over here, how's your night going? Doing all right? How you doing for a Wednesday? You know, when I first started doing these uh, cocktail-specific streams, um, I, think, I think it originally started as 
precursors to the games that I was playing, um, specifically only on Wednesdays. Cocktails would always be on Wednesdays, because uh, one time, hanging out with my buddies in college, and we just kind of happened to come across the, co across the conclusion that everything interesting happens on a Wednesday. And I thought, you know, middle of the week, something interesting happened, and that's why I chose Wednesday. Anyway, that took a lot less time to shuck than I thought it was going to. Um, so, that's all. Oh my god, here we go. Oh, there we go. Don't need that part anymore. There we go. Some shuck corn. How's that taste, Cam? Mmm! There's such a nice crunch to it. I love it. Mmm! Just bought this corn today. Honestly, I don't even see the need to cook this stuff. It's great. Oh, I love that. Oh, more than also says I like having a drunk drinking buddy midweek. Yeah, yeah I, I like that. I like that. I, I've said I've said at least once before on stream too. Like I like honestly, the people that I surround myself in my life with, for the most part, like the really close people that I have, don't really drink. So I don't often go out to bars. I don't often go out to clubs. Um, but I still wanted to explore this world of mixology. So that's why I have a home bar here. And it's nice. And now, all the people who like to drink or like to explore get to come here to our house and be able to, and I be able to share it with them, which is great. And also, because we have the whole internet thing here, I can share it with y'all as well, which I'm, if I haven't said it already, I'm super appreciative for. This is insanely fun. It's an amazing hobby that I've gotten now, and I probably wouldn't have continued to do this and put as much effort into it if it wasn't, wasn't for the, the feedback back and forth, like, hey, this is fun, we're doing good, and we have fun. So, thank you. And you're welcome. So what we need in our blender is we need the corn. We need the corn kernels. We need to remove the corn kernels from our corn cob here. I was informed today that there is an apparatus, a tool that you can use to properly get the corn off the kernel. I don't know. I don't have access to that. I really don't have that. I thought maybe I could use like my like my peeler and stuff, but I think I'm just going to use a knife. When I used to prepare corn with my family, if we needed to get the corn kernels off, I would just kind of I just kind of use a knife. I'd, I'd scrape it all off. So I'm going to scrape it off into the blender, and then we're going to add the water afterwards. The recipe specifically calls for a single. Um, ear of corn so this one's more or less for decoration right now until i decide to cook with it later this week which i most definitely will uh, to a third of a cup of water um alexa how many liters is a third of a cup of water 0 0.3333 cups of water is 0.0789 liters. 0.0789 liters for those across the pond probably should have res re uh, measured that in milliliters but in any case here we are so we need the corn stuff in here so, I'm going to naturally take my knife. I'm going to use, I don't know if it's best to use a serrated knife or otherwise. I'm going to use a serrated one just because it is most accessible. And I'm going to take my liquid intelligence book and put it away. I'm not using that right now. Also, I realized that the ultimate guide, the spirits and cocktails book that I threw on the ground like an hour to the stream, I got a bunch of water on top of. Whoops. It's okay. It's just a lexicon of human knowledge. It's fine. Um, if you're cutting, cut away from yourself. I really don't know how this is going to work, so I'm just going to try my damnedest here. Corn in the blender. Again, blender is not plugged in. Not right now, at least. Everything's okay for now. Then things get crazy. I think, if I if I recall, what I did was I just kind of like... I just like... I just kind of cut. That's all, that's all I do. Just kind of cut along the length of the corn. I'm going to try to do it into the blender. I'm kind of like, I'm kind of just like keeping the knife in one place and then just moving the corn upwards. There's probably better ways to do this, but to be perfectly honest, I don't need to be perfect at this either. This is just fine. I could also most likely do it on my cutting board first, but honestly, this was the bright idea that I came up with. Um, naturally, if you're doing it like this, please just be careful. Please be careful. For those who are a little more inclined to mistakes than I, and I'm already pretty inclined for mistakes, this, this might not end very well, but I'm trying to make sure that my fingers stay away from the knife. So I'm just going to keep on doing that. I'm going to get all the all the coin kernels on the inside. So hopefully try. I'm actually making a little bit of a mess back here, all things considered. There we go. I don't like it when the knife done that. Oh, I don't like the. You know what? I think I'm just going to suck it up. I don't really like the way that this is going. I'm going to put it to the side and I'm going to use my cutting board. I'm not comfortable with the way that's working out, so I'm gonna take the I'm gonna take the take the lame way out. I guess now we can watch we can watch us cut corn if we want to. 
Why not? We might as well. We might as well make it. Make it that way. Cutting corn. Cutting corn, dude. Corn on the cob, dude. Cut away from yourself, dude. Don't like. Don't make mistakes that'll lose your fingers, dude. Not good, dude. Not very good at all, dude. Oh my god, but it's making a mess. Oh man, dude. Oh man, dude. I don't like that at all, dude. Ugh. I did not, in particular, consider the ramifications of making chicha in this way on the stream. Oh, that one came off pretty well. Oh, that's not really... Boop. There we go. Corn. Corn, my friends! It's all about corn. That's tonight's episode. It's corn. Why did we pick corn? Because we could, dude. That's why. I don't remember why I came up with corn. I think I remember starting the Monday stream saying, I'm definitely going to plan for corn. And I, oh, oh, that was it. I remember, I remember now. Apparently, I think it's one of the days this month. Let me check, let me check, let me check. I have my calendar on standby. Popcorn Lover's Day is on Thursday, March 9th, evidently. And so I wanted to do a corn stream because I thought corn, popcorn. I had the cinema highball recipe already, and so I looked up a couple more corn stuff, and then was like, yo, bourbon's got corn in it. We should totally do this. And so we did. All right, let me get the rest of this corn off. There we go. There we go. Yeah, I like this. I like this angle a little bit better. It feels less bad. It feels less dangerous, honestly. All right, this corn has been completely decobbed. And so, naturally, what I will do is I will just put it all into the blender. Alright, dude. Let's try to get, as carefully as I possibly can, all corn. Who put the corn in the blender? I, I don't know who put the corn in the blender. Who put the corn in the blender? My face is blocking me putting the corn in the blender. Look at that. Who's putting the corn in the blender? I'm putting the corn in the blender. Cameron shouldn't be putting the corn in the blender, but the corn in the blender is gonna taste good. That's what the internet says. The internet says the corn tastes good. So naturally, you gotta put the corn in the blender. There we go. And I'm gonna try to get any of the other stragglers and stuff and just kind of like throw them in there. I'm trying not to waste things. I'm becoming more and more waste mindful on this stream here. Um, I've already researched some ways to be able to like accurately do, like properly do like composting here in the city because the streams produce a lot of peel waste. And I don't exactly, I, I don't like the fact that I throw all this stuff away. I want that to change. So, um, I need to look into it further. But, um, small, slow and steady improvements to our lives and the things that we put in our lives. Like, like this stream here, because it's fun. Boop, boop. All right, that's a lot of, that's, that's a significant amount of corn kernels, I think. That is an entire corn de decobbed, I guess. There we go. Good stuff. And now that we got that, here's the rest of my cob. You could, I, I am more than positive, there are more things that you can do with this corn cob. Honestly, right off the bat, you could probably take this and put it in some boiling water and make a little bit of a syrup out of it. I'm gonna put it with the rest of my corn stuff. I know there's a particular um, co uh, account that I follow on TikTok that specifically talks about um, food and like how to use all of it, like how not to waste the food that you use. And I don't remember what the name of this one is um but he's got like tattoos and he's got like a little bit of an accent he's like don't don't do this you should also be doing this that was the kind of the accent that he had and i love his i love his content it's great i think i found how to make polenta from him that's where i also got the corn idea i saw him making polenta out of corn and i was like this is a great idea i think i got a little bit of my corn cob in my my old-fashioned i forgot to write up the other part of this this is chicha describes the whole like i guess the well the corn in the water you boil it it does stuff chicha and dina in this case which is what we're making does not involve the boiling process it involves the corn milk and it adds some rum to it as well specifically the recipe calls for rum agricole which is fundamentally a different type of sugarcane spirit than anything that I have. I don't have rum agricole, so instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute it with something else. Probably something a little more flavor forward, like one of my Jamaican nuns. And Dina. For the Andes Mountains, which happened to run through Peru, which was where the other uh, chicha recipe came from. So I need to add 
a collection of mm, cups, milliliters to this blender here. I forgot to take my measuring cup upstairs, but that's okay. That's the beauty of conversions. Alexa, what is a third of a cup in milliliters? 78.68. So I'm gonna put about two and a quarter ounces of water into my blender, which is easy to do because I have measuring jiggers now. Here's about two ounces, and I put like half an ounce. Oh, that, that's what I wanted meant to say, half an ounce. I put a little more. I put like two thirds, two thirds of an ounce, about. 22 milliliters of water in there. And we're just gonna blend this whole thing up. We're gonna blend it up, and this will create the base for our corn milk. We're just gonna we're gonna strain it out after it's all mixed in, um, mixed together, and we'll use that as an ingredient in the cocktail that comes after. I guess specifically, the cocktail is called Chicha Andina. The, the substance that I'm creating here might not be called that. I'm gonna move my microphone over here a little bit because the plug is here. Here we go. Plug it underneath. It's kind of cool. This uh, this little bar thing that we got actually came with an extension cord already installed in it. And all I needed to do is plug it into the wall, which is awesome. The blender is now plugged in. You will not see me putting my hand into it. I will put the microphone a little closer to me over there, over that's that's as far as it's gonna go. That's fine. In order to blend your chicha, in this case, with using the sweet the sweet corn that we picked up at the terminal today, put it in the blender, seal that thing up, make sure that no body parts or other foreign contaminants are in it, and I wonder if it says specifically how to. Let me just let me just let me just double check this one, you know. Let me just double check this. One. Combine corn curdles with water and blend on high for 10 seconds. Strain through a fine mesh strainer and use immediately on bar or bottle to refrigerate on high. Blend it on high. Puree for 10 seconds. Let's go for it. Cover your ears. It's about to get loud a little bit. All right, so that was like 10 seconds, but to be honest, it kind of struggled for that first part, and I think I need to shake it a little bit. So like, I would say, in my pseudo-professional opinion, blend until smooth-ish, I guess. I don't think of it. I just don't think there's enough liquid in there. There needs to be more liquid in the center for it to like properly like gain a consistency. So I'm gonna play around with it for a little bit. I'm not much of a blender. Pulse it perhaps. All things considered, that is definitely less, more pulpy. That's, that's more smooth than it was previously. And I don't need too much of it, so I think that'll be okay. If y'all want to take a look, I will show you in just a moment. Let me unplug the blender first. It's still got a bit more, still got a bit more chunk in there. Which is, it's fine. It's fine. I'll reuse it for something else. I think, I, I like the way that corn tastes, so I don't think I'll, I don't think I'll just toss it on this one. Let's see. How's that looking on the inside? How that corn looking? Chicha. I'm gonna open it up. Oh my gosh. There we go. That is our corn milk, or at least the precursor to our corn milk. That's cool. I wonder how it tastes. I am most definitely going to taste this. I am very, very curious to see what this tastes like, obviously. All right, so the next thing you need to do is you need to put this through a fine mesh strainer. I have a fine mesh strainer. I'm going to put it into one of my spare containers, which I'll go down and grab real quick. Bought a bunch of containers just so I can make sure that I don't waste things on this stream. It's a problem I have. And we're just gonna kind of strain that out into the container and then measure as necessary for the cocktail that we're making out of it. This container smells reminiscent of the spicy spirits stream. Because I, re I reuse containers too, and peppers have a very peppers are potent. 
Uh, where'd my... There's my find mist strainer. I'm just going to strain that out. It doesn't say, like, use cheesecloth or anything like that, so chances are you really don't need to. And I could probably use a bigger strainer. I probably need a bigger strainer. Come to think of it. Because I'm not, not doing too hot here. Oh, real life leprechaun. Dude, St. Patty's Day is coming up, my friend. Really, really is. Actually, gonna do some cocktails then, too. They're gonna be Irish based. Irish and, um, well, I mean, we're gonna try to make them green, too. Actually, in terms of planning for that particular cocktail stream, which I guess is two weeks from now, I was like, I kind of want to do green drinks, but I also want to do Irish drinks. Actually, when I was out at the store buying ingredients for this stream, I found the pack of Guinness. So, of course, the Irish in me, the leprechaun in me, had to go out there and buy me a uh, buy me at least a pint of Guinness to prepare myself for St. Patty's Day, which is coming up quickly. One of my buddies was like, yo, you want to go out for Aaron Express, which is, I think, a thing that you do in Philadelphia. I don't know if it's specifically a Philly thing, but essentially you go out and get, like, you go around the bars. It's a bar, bar crawl for uh, St. Patrick's Day. So I'm gonna actually do this a little bit in batches here. I'm gonna put a little bit in there. I'm gonna put the other corny constituents into a different container. And then I'll, I'll store the two separate. I think that'll be, that'll be okay. We have a vast array of containers that I can use. So I'm just gonna use all of them. This, is, this feels like it's worth sharing as well. So I'm gonna pull out the other angle here. Kinda, kinda snake it around the blender. It's nice that we have the boom arm for this. There we go. I think that's all right. By the way, I also want to apologize. If any of this, like, if any of this, like, camera angle stuff, like, makes you dizzy, let me know. Because then that means if I know that it's a bit of an issue, then I should be able to try to find a way around it. That or just get good. Should also get good, too. Essentially, all I'm doing now is we blended up the corn and the water, and we're just, we're straining it. And I got a little bit of chunk in there, so I think I'm going to have to sacrifice one of my other containers. That, or I can just be careful. I think that'll be okay. Put the gunk in there. This reminds me, uh, I bought a guava at the store, I think two weeks ago, and I made some guava nectar out of it. Uh, it's still in my, it's still in my fridge. I don't think I've actually done anything with it, to be perfectly honest. I'm gonna shake this up a little bit. There's a lot of, a lot of gunk at the bottom there. There we go. Honestly, this is more than enough. I'm just trying to get as much out as I possibly can. There we go. That was a big one. There we go. Get them on in there. Perfection. All right. I think that's more than enough. It smells good. I kind of like that. So now I'm curious. I want to know what the corn milk tastes like. I'm going to take the blender and put it down on the side. I'll clean that up later. Oh. Excuse me, my back. I'm getting so old in my mid 20s. I want to know what this tastes like. This is just, it's corn mush. It's partially blended corn. Wow. Tastes like corn. Who knew? I had no idea. Corn plus water makes something that tastes like corn. Wow, it's magic. And the corn milk, which is again, corn plus water, smells like corn. Wow. Tastes heavily like corn. That surprised me. That that one, that one really came out of left field there. Anyways. So now that you've got your corn constituents, I will put them off to the side. So this particular, this, this corn milk can be good to use up for up to two weeks, said the recipe that I found online. Take that as it will. If it starts to smell weird or starts to look weird, please use your best judgment. Or if you don't have that sort of sense of judgment and you just want to go for it, YOLO, right? So moving on to the rest of the Chicha Andina recipe, we have created our corn milk, which basically involved taking the corn off the cob, putting it into a blender and combining it with water. Simple. What we're also going to do is we're going to combine it with other constituents to create a cocktail out of it. The way that we prepare this is we put it into a cocktail shaker. So I got to take my shaker, which I got over here. I'm going to do a little trick with it because I think it's cool. Popped it on there. I'm going to grab myself a large ice cube and a couple of small ice cubes from my freezer. Oh my goodness. I, I also mentioned too that at the end of the stream, we're making a cocktail that uses 
popcorn and butter infused rum. And I just took a look at the popcorn butter and fruit rum that's currently sitting in the freezer and it looks disgusting. I cannot wait to make something with it. Ew. Ew, says Anna. Big cube? In the small glass or big glass? I don't remember anymore. Big one. And a couple of little cubes. That's just kind of the way I do it. And... Oh my god, don't fly away. There we go. Oh, you closed my freezer, dears. Yeah, I was eating it, silly. Okie dokie. Have a wonderful night, my love. Anna's a working girl. She's got to go get rest. I am also a working boy. I should also get rest, but alas, I am screaming with the people. So, what we need to add to our shaker and combine together. I think we add everything to combine. I combine all ingredients except ice and garnish and shake to combine. If why why would I shake without the ice? That mm, I don't know if I agree with that. Feast magazine. <laughs> so. What you will do here is you will add an ounce and a half or about 44 milliliters or about 40. Whoa, I'm blanking on my measurements. Yeah, about 44 ish milliliters of rum agricole. Rum, in this case, R H U M agricole. Um, I don't have any of that. And to be perfectly honest, I don't know what rum agricole is. So we're going to research that right now. Alexa, what is rum agricole? And she didn't listen to me. That's fine. That's okay. We'll learn another time. At some point, when I get my hands on some rum agricole, we'll we'll play around with that. I believe that it's an ingredient used in tiki cocktails, but that might just be the whole rum part of it that I'm just getting myself distracted by. I don't have any rum agricole, so you can also use dark rum for a more sweeter uh, chicha and vina, or you can use white rum for a more subdued words of the words of the cocktail creator uh, recipe. I'm gonna use dark rum because I wanted a little more. Or a little more sweet. So I'm gonna go down and I'm gonna grab myself some Myers. That's my that's the dark my dark rum of choice. I like it very much. We're gonna add an ounce and a half or about 44 milliliters to our cocktail shaker, specifically on the side that doesn't have the ice in it. We're gonna let the ice like come up the temperature a little bit more um, while we add our liquid ingredients on the other side. Myers rum to me has like a molassesy, sugary taste to it, and it smells. Ooh, it really does smell like there's a there's a bottle of molasses. I, I started working at this job of mine about a year and a half ago And there has been this bottle of molasses sitting by the coffee machine and it has been there the entire time I decided once upon a time to go over and open it up and take a sniff at it and I was like I've smelled this before and I went back home I opened up this bottle of Myers rum and I was like, oh my god It smells like Myers the molasses. So I would say Quite confidently, and Myers rum smells like molasses. Kind of tastes like molasses too, because I did put a little bit on my finger and taste it, and I was like, you know, kind of tastes like Myers rum. It was pretty good. The next ingredient that we're going to need is an ounce or about 30 milliliters of our fresh corn milk, which we just made in our blender. Corn milk, again, you take the corn off the cob, combine with water, there you go. And then the, separate the solids from the sweet, from the liquids. The refinement strainer. We need an ounce, so I should flip that the other direction. Hopefully, I have about an ounce in here. I'm sure I probably do. And what I'm going to do as well, because I know that there's some particulates in here, when I strain this, I'm going to double strain it just to make sure I get everything out. That's it's interesting. The corn milk has a very I don't, I don't know if I showed that specifically before. It has a very very milky, very milky uh, white consistency. I'm going to put this in the top of my shaker just so y'all can get a little look at that. It is very. Is a very very milky color. Oh come on, better better angle, dude. I know you can do a better angle. There we go. Very very opaque. This is not transparent like at all. I was actually very surprised about that. I thought there'd be a little bit of a transparency there. Just I don't really know why. There is a lot of very opaque qualities about the corn milk, which which makes it seem like it's milk. Makes sense. The next ingredient that we need is a half an ounce or about 15 milliliters of fresh pineapple juice. I don't have fresh pineapple juice. Instead, what I have is just pineapple juice, which I'm going to grab from my fridge. Oh, there we go. I know this is I know this is still good. It's been in there for I think uh, about a couple days now, but I'm just going to give it a little bit of give it a little bit of a shake. Make sure that it's all combined together. Not about half an ounce or 15 milliliters of the pineapple juice. 
It seems that the pineapple juice, in addition to the corn, is a very particular choice that is being made here. I've seen it when I was looking up the other stuff, the like other iterations of chicha. I had found that pineapple juice was making a like it was regularly making its appearance. So the whole rum, corn milk, pineapple combo is making an appearance elsewhere. It's not totally uncommon. It is a combination that I've literally never heard of, um, but. I'm curious about it nonetheless. While I'm over here too, in preparation, I'm grabbing some cinnamon syrup that we have as well. That will also come up a little bit later. The next ingredient that we need is, oh, look at that, cinnamon syrup. I told you it was coming up a little bit later. Half an ounce, 15 milliliters. This is made by, quite simply, combining cinnamon in water, bringing it to a boil, adding sugar to it, equal parts by volume to the water, and um, you got yourself a nice little syrup there. And it smells, I love the smell of cinnamon. This is like, it's been, it's been marinating for a little bit, but it's still good. And this smells like the potpourri that you would experience around the Christmas holiday season. It's like, it's like walking into the, this smells like the Christmas aisle at Walmart. Getting those, getting those flashbacks seriously. Half an ounce or about 15 milliliters go into your cocktail shaker. So right now we've got some rum, rumish. Rum, not agricole, just regular rum. Corn milk, pineapple juice, and cinnamon juice. We put this away. We also need lemon juice, Angostura bitters, and that's that's it. I'm gonna grab my lemon juice because I'm conserving a little bit of that too. I got some extra. I, I, I'm, I'm doing really good today. Um, you're using ingredients of the past. You need that. What else did I need? I needed the lemon juice. And ango. That's that's what else I needed. So I got the lemon juice and the Angostura is over here. Lemon juice, I believe I believe the same th rule applies to lemon juice as it does lime juice. Lemon juice and lime juice, if you have extra, put it in your freezer. Unthought. Tastes basically no different. I've tried it a couple times, not as much as, but let's say, the professionals, but I would say for the most part, that is a pretty good conclusion to come to. I think for the most part, it doesn't smell, taste any different than it did previously. Actually, this lemon juice smells a little odd. But that might be because I literally juiced the lemons three days ago. So that's what I have. So that's what I'm going to use. You need a teaspoon of lemon juice. I don't know how many milliliters that is. I think that's five milliliters. Alexa, how many milliliters are in a teaspoon? One teaspoon is about 4.9 milliliters. Oh, it's five milliliters. I knew it. Uh, it's going to be difficult to measure in a thing anyway. So I'm just going to like, I'm going to put a little splash of it. There we go. That's all. Five milliliters. Teaspoon. 4.9. Was on point there. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff indeed. And next, we're going to need two dashes of Angostura bitters. Angostura bitters have made an appearance so far twice. Two for two. Two dashes. One, two. And that's all you need. Note, if you get this on your bar, it'll stain. So watch out. So what we have in our cocktail shaker right now is an ounce and a half or 44 milliliters of rum. Rum agricole is preferred, but you could also use a dark or a light. I use the dark. I like it that way. One ounce or 30 milliliters of corn milk, taking corn, water, blending it, straining out the solids, using the liquids. One or half an ounce or 15 milliliters of pineapple juice and cinnamon syrup, a half an ounce of each of them. One teaspoon or about five milliliters of lemon juice if you got it fresh Cool. This recipe specifically calls for fresh pineapple juice and corn milk, but not fresh lemon juice, which confuses me, but alas. And then two dashes of Angostura bitters. Now, what they say here as well is you give a recipe for cinnamon syrup. I did not follow this recipe, but for the sake of, of completion, allow me to share what the recipe is. Nope, I didn't write it down. Just kidding. Equal parts by volume, sugar, and water. Put a cinnamon stick in it or two, or three, or the whole damn bottle. You could probably also use powdered cinnamon too, but that might have a weird separation thing that goes on there. Honestly, I never tried it with that. I'm gonna take a quick sip of my old fashioned from earlier, specifically the Larceny old fashioned, which tastes a lot like corn. Damn it, it still does. Wow, I love that. Now that I, like, I, th I think if there's one takeaway that I have from the stream so far, it's that now I think I can pick out corn flavor in spirits, which is something I definitely was not able to do before. It's all a learning process. It's all a learning process. Coolio. So now, naturally, once you have your liquid, 
all constituented. Pour it into your other glass and give it a shake. I don't know exactly what type of glass we want to strain this into. Let me take a let me take a closer look. Looks like an old-fashioned glass, right? Add ice, shake. Oh, you're not supposed to shake it with ice first. That's interesting. That confuses me. Anyways, old-fashioned glass with fresh ice, garnished with a cinnamon stick, baby corn. Serve. I don't have baby corn. But I do got a cinnamon stick, so I am going to use a cinnamon stick. And I'll grab myself one of the remaining old-fashioned glasses that I have. We'll put it there. I'm going to grab myself some ice. I've got some... It's not crushed ice. Um, I have tiny rice. Should I use the tiny, the, the tiny rice, I say? I'm going to use these ones. I'll use these ones here. And I'll fill up my glass with them. Chicha Andina! Give that a shake for as long as you deem necessary. Yeehaw! I'm supposed to be dressed like a farmer today, although to be fair, I am looking a little leprechaun-y. Alright. Woo doggy! I'm gonna pour that into a glass over some ice. We'll garnish with a cinnamon stick. If you've got baby corn, you can also put a little thing of baby corn in it. But I was not able to find the baby corn, unfortunately, so I'm not going to be able to provide that this time around. I got my glass here. Let's see. Put some ice in it, as much as, as much as we want to, I guess. It doesn't specifically say how much, it just says put it into a glass filled with ice. Specifically, a double old-fashioned glass. And this feels equivalent to a double old-fashioned glass. I'm gonna grab myself my cinnamon stick as well from one of my containers over here. Specifically, salon cinnamon. I would say the salon cinnamon taste, it smells so good. I'll take a small one, because I don't think I need a really, really big one for that. Here, here's one that's kind of... Oh, no, you're not small. I can always buy more. Put a cinnamon stick in there. There we go. We're working on our presentation skills over here. And technically, you could also just garnish it with an entire piece of corn on the cob. Just like this. There we go. What a beautiful cocktail, he says. Silly. And we're going to double strand that over the top. You know, I've got a bit of... I've got bits of Got bits of corn hair that we can put in there. There we go. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Whatever. Double straining it anyways. And for that, Hawthorne strainer on top. And I have the remainder of my corn strainer from before. So I'm just going to reuse it because I was using another strainer previously. Ooh. That is a very, very opaque combination. Interesting. Make sure I get all the constituents in there. I hope I'm using that term correctly. I've been using constituents a lot. I don't know if I actually am using it right. Hey! All right, let me get a better angle on that. That's a really nice color too. There's some Angostura bitters in there, which gives it that red color, but there's also the corn milk as well. That's actually really, that's, that's not bad looking. Cool. A little bit further. Get a better, better angle on that. Move it back a bit. I don't know, whatever. You know what? Let's do... We got the cinnamon stick there. Put the corn in the background. Corn. Corn, dude. Actually, I'm going to take a picture of that. That looks beautiful. Let's hope my bot works for me. Bam. I hope it does. We can, we can only hope so. If the bot's not working now, then apparently I didn't fix anything. Oh, it looks like I didn't fix anything. Okie dokie. That's okay, because when the bot's not working, we can fix it. So hold on. I think I might have been able to fix the bot. If it's not working, we can do this. Maybe, if it responds to me. And if it doesn't, then whatever. That's okay. Hey, right, we're back online. Which means I should be able to do this now. Now it should work. Yes. Oh my god. Sweet. So now at the very least, there is a way to fix the bot if the bot's not responding. I don't exactly know why the bot stops responding. I will continue to debug that. But in the meantime, at least we have a way to fix it. And that's a step in the right direction. So, what we have here is uh, chicha and dina. Chicha, either coming from the word for girl or meat or flesh, and andina coming from the Andes Mountains. It contains within it rum, corn milk, a 
a particular reagent that I've never used before, never even tried before. And it's got some cinnamon syrup in there, pineapple juice, Angostura bitters, and lemon juice as well to add a little bit of a sourness to it. It looks opaque. It smells like rum. The Myers rum is very, very prevalent off the nose. Oh, interesting. Ah, that's really pleasant, actually. Wow. So, first couple things I'm getting is I taste I taste the rum in there. I taste the pineapple juice in there. Actually, at the very very end, I got a piece of the I got the Angostura in there as well. Wow. The lemon juice, there's not very sour. Not very sour at all. I think everything else balances out the sour very well. It's rum. I don't want to say the the rum is prominent, but not because of the alcohol. Not because it's alcohol. It's prominent because I can take like I know what Myers rum tastes like. It's molassesy. It's sugary. It's viscous in flavor, I guess, and I taste that. But it's combining with the pineapple juice, which is very very nice. The corn milk is kind of lost on me, but I can I can see this being a different cocktail with a different flavor if you didn't include the corn milk in there. It would certainly look different. This honestly looks like it's like a like a latte or something that you would get from like Starbucks or something. This could almost be like a fall latte. If you if you put this on my desk and was like, hey, I made you a cool fall latte, I'd be like, yeah, sure. Then I'd sniff it and be like, wait a minute. Then I'd drink it and be like, you're lying to me. But you'd have me at first, first sight. And it's really tasty. I really like that. That is really laid back. It is balanced. It's sweet. Overall, it is sweet, sugary, and pleasant. It's just like it's a very it's a very clear cocktail. All things considered, the alcohol is not super present. You can very comfortably sip this. This is this is very it's almost tropical in a way because probably because of the pineapple juice in there if I'm being honest. It's tiki-ish. This would go... Pfft, if it's tiki-like, this would go amazing with orja. Or like, this combo with a little amaretto too would probably be very, very good. This really does taste like it would do, go really well with amaretto specifically. Yeah, that's really good. This is an excellent, excellent way to drink a dark rum. Again, I don't know what rum agricole tastes like, but... If rum agricole is, or agricole, I don't know exactly how to pronounce that. If it's similar in a way to, let's say, a more darker rum, it pairs very well with this. It is very comfortable to drink. It reminds me a lot of a tiki beverage. It's really good. Wow, I like that. That's really, really good. Whew, man, I got so distracted by that. I'm going to take my old fashioned. Um, the Larceny Old Fashioned, and put that to the side. I was got a new drink. This one's much, much better. It's It's got more, to be fair, the Old Fashioned, all of them. Probably could have used more sugar. Probably could have used more sweetness. At least for my particular taste, this is a much more palatable cocktail. I love this Chicha Andina. This is so good. Wow. Farmer Cameron's impressed. This is delightful. Yes, indeed it is. Oh, wow. And to think, we're not done yet. So, what have we covered so far? So, on this particular stream, the fact that there's corn in your cocktails, the, 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 in, the in reference is that, of course, there's corn in your cocktails. Bourbon, which is an American-made spirit made from at least 51% corn and a couple of other laws that we covered earlier, is it's, it's mostly corn, you could say. By volume, it is mostly corn in there as a part of the mash bill that you use to impart the flavor into the spirit itself. So, of course, there's corn in your cocktails. It's an obvious thing. I feel like you would look at this and think to yourself, yeah, of course there's corn in your cocktails. That makes so much sense. But, like... There's other ways to do it as well. When I think of corn in my cocktails, I immediately think of whiskey. I immediately think of bourbon. But I don't immediately think of corn as a juice to be used in a cocktail as such it is here. The corn milk is essentially just a juice of the corn, a puree that is uh, strained out from the solids and uses as an ingredient in the cocktail. And it makes something really, really good. Maybe... It would be similar if this uh, chicha andina were with without the corn, uh, the corn milk. But like, 
that that remains beyond the scope. If we wanted to make two of them, we could, but it just feel like it'd be a little bit of a waste of time. Plus, this tastes so damn good on its own. I would say, of the qualities of the corn milk I'm getting, is that it's not totally lost on me. Without drinking it, with it sitting on the on the back of my just the back of my palate, it tastes of the molasses of the rum, the cinnamon, and a little bit of the vegetal nature of the corn. Also, the corn is sweet. The corn milk was sweet. And so that's probably imparting to the sweetness. I don't really know what type of sweetness it is. I guess I wonder, Alexa, what type of sugar is present in sweet corn? According to an Alexa answers consumer, okay. sweet corn is made sweet by the presence of a sugar called sucrose. Hmm. Sucrose is a common sugar produced by plants. Okay, Alexa, stop. That's fine. So that's sucrose. Sucrose seems to be the sugar there. I think when I was looking through one of my other books, it seems that sucrose, fructose, I think are the main two. I'm oh, sorry, sucrose, glucose, I think are the main two. And then fructose pops up in things like agave syrup. And I believe, ah, oh, I, I found the other day something else contains fructose, and I don't remember what it was. But it was another fruit or something like that. In any case, discussion for another time. This has become the bartender's drink. I like this chicha andina. And we'll move on to the final libation that we have for this evening. There is corn in your cocktails. You can find your corn in your bourbon and your whiskey. You can find your corn as corn milk in your chichas, andinas, and both for moradas for the purple corn variety. Which, if I can find purple corn later on this month, I will create the Chicha Morada as a part of the purple stream that we'll have. Purple Day! Because, like, apparently purple is, like, the color for Lent, too. So, Anna, Anna informed me of that. But the next thing we have is using corn in a different way. Take your corn, and what do you think of? Do you think of, like, corn on the cob? Do you think of, like, corn soup and stuff? One of the things I think of is popcorn, naturally. Put it in the microwave? Pop out, comes out popped. Put it on your stove, a little bit of oil, comes out popped. You go to the movie theater, you got your butter, delicious popcorn there. So the question is, can you use popcorn in a cocktail? And the answer is yes, you absolutely can. And so what I've been teasing more or less this entire time is something something that was something that I did because the, the internet informed me to. And naturally, if the internet says, this is a great idea, why wouldn't you, naturally? So what I have here is a bottle that contains a particular combination of stuff. This looks disgusting. Essentially, what we did was create buttered popcorn infused rum. Buttered popcorn infused rum, which I'm sharing right now. Um, what I'm thinking of doing, I tried to film the rest, the beginning of the process, so maybe I'll try to put out a small little video of like how to make this do yourself and whether the cocktail actually comes out good or not. I don't really know. Um, but this is the intent to find out. Essentially, to create buttered popcorn infused rum, what you have to do is you have to take popcorn. The first thing that you do is you pop some popcorn. Then what you do is you take it, you take the entire batch of popcorn and you put it into rum. The, I think the recipe that I saw calls for an entire bottle of rum, 750 milliliters just about, to an entire serving of popcorn. Exactly how much popcorn that is, I'm not exactly sure. However, you combine them together and let that sit for about an hour. What happens after about an hour is you get this rum that smells really, really weird. It smells like popcorn, but it doesn't smell like movie theater popcorn. It smells like somebody took popcorn, put it into like a washing machine, and got it all wet and gooky, and then stuck it into a bottle. It's a really, really weird smell. And even now, I haven't cracked this thing open yet, but I will in a little bit. It smelled weird. So next what you do is you take the now kind of pop, eau de popcorn rum and you put butter into it. For every 750 milliliters, you will add about a, if I'm quoting this correctly, a tablespoon or maybe of the thing. I will put the recipe in the, in the VODs and in the Discord. I will put the recipe for all this stuff in case I can't quote it correctly. But you will take, oh no, no, it's an ounce of clarified butter, which is two tablespoons, I believe. I had half a bottle of the rum, so I used just about a single tablespoon of butter. And you chop it up and you put it inside of this container here with the rum and you let it sit for 24 hours. What you're doing here is you're essentially, I believe you're fat washing, I think. Although not fat washing in the way that I'm familiar with. I'm not gonna bother going into the semantics of fat washing because I'm not exactly sure how it all works yet. And I'm sure at some point I will do an episode specifically on it because I have some recipes for chocolate. I think chocolate washed bourbon that I really wanna try at some point. And I'll probably just theme an episode around it. Sounds like it'll be fun. 
But so you take your butter, you put it inside your rum, you let it sit for 24 hours, just about, and then after 24 hours, you put it into the freezer for another two to three hours, and then you let that separate out from itself. Essentially, as the liquid gets colder, I'm not sure if you can see over here, as the liquids get colder, the fats and stuff will exit the solution and float up to the top, and all we need to do is filter it out. So essentially, now what we have is a solution that we need to filter just a little bit more. It's, let me see what this smells like. I gotta open it first. It's a very... Oof. I gotta put my muscles to work. I gotta get my thing. You can get these little, like, grippy things at the store. They're excellent. They work well. If they want to, that is. This is, this is, not, <laughs> this is not coming loose. Oh my gosh, I'm so close. I am so close. I might need to get another one of these things. All right, maybe I'll try my, maybe I'll try my shirt. I hope I don't make a mistake. There we go. Cool, I didn't make a mistake. Everything's okay. The shirt stays on, the pants stay on. The lid. The lid comes off. And what is that? I'm really curious of what this smells like. That smells almost just as weird as it did yesterday. It smells specific. Okay, now that I'm thinking about it more, it smells like like if you pop popcorn in a pan with some oil and stuff. It smells like the the pot afterwards. Like if you stuck your nose into the bottom of the the pot that is at this point cooled because you don't want to hurt yourself, it would smell like just kernels, like wet kernels. Very. Very, very interesting. This is a very interesting smell there. In any case, this is popcorn-infused rum. I'm, cur I'm curious to what it tastes like, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to separate the things from each other, and essentially, it's it's rum. It's popcorn-infused rum. This is not going to leave the bar. This is going to become another ingredient in the collection that you see before you. Um, what else we can use it in? I'm honestly not so sure, but it's something that I hope to be able to explore at some point. So what I'll do is I'm going to I'll grab another bottle, grab myself a funnel and under the top i have my strainer i think what i want to do is actually want to use a little bit of a little bit of cheesecloth here um because i or maybe i do want to use the strainer i think i probably do want to use the strainer um i'm going to use just because i have it just, just because i can use it i'm going to use my julep strainer it's not that this is definitely not the way that you're supposed to do it but i uh i have a lack of strainers at this bar so uh, that's what I'm going to use. And essentially just gonna pour it all in, hoping to not get any of the 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 buttery bits inside. Although some of them are gonna make it down there. It's just, it's inevitable. Oh, it's on my fingers. Ah! Oh my God. And I put too much of it in there and it's, pfft. ooh. Ooh, that's unfortunate. That is a very, very unfortunate thing that's happened here. I overfilled the bottle a little bit. Also there's like, oh my goodness. I've made a mess. Just a tad, just a tad bit of a mess here. That's okay. We're in it to win it. So there we go. This is butter. I'm going to, in the in the effort to not waste things, I'm gonna put it in a different container and probably use this butter to make myself eggs in the morning. Because it is still butter, even though it looks like this. And I actually do have quite a little bit of the rum left, so I think I will use that for the rest of this here. There is still... There is still, like, buttery bits in it. And there's a little bit of... It's, it didn't completely filter out, um, so I think I should probably pass this through. I really think I should pass it through the cheesecloth. This is... alarming. But, I think for the purposes of the cocktail this evening, I will prepare it more a little bit after the fact. This is... this is fine for now, it seems separated most of my butter out. I think what I'll do is I'll just I'll transfer containers completely. There we go. That way I can clean, clean this mason jar. Do something else with it. These will go off to the side. Mason jar will get cleaned completely. And we'll put the butter down here. Utilize that a little bit more in the morning. All right, so what we have before us is popcorn infused rum. Popcorn in the sense that there is popcorn in it and there is butter in it. That's the way that I usually eat my popcorn. It's with butter, naturally. I'm just doing a little bit of cleanup as well. I am kind of curious to see what this tastes like, all things considered. The butter, like there are, oh my gosh, I have to show you guys this. This is, 
the, oh my god. There is so much butter just collected at the top here. It is kind of disgusting. Oh my goodness, you don't have to stare at that much longer. Ooh. Actually, I'm going to pour out like a little bit of it just to get the butter off the top. There we go. <laughs> the butter really did float to the top and I want no piece of that. All right, I want to see what this tastes like. So I'm going to put a little bit in my little cordial glass here and we're going to see what... Not buttered rum, not hot buttered rum. No, no. Popcorn butter rum. What does that taste like? It smells like the kernels. We've described this already. This was mixed with just this regular white rum. Bacardi specifically. Bacardi white. Wow, that's incredible. Wow. That tastes like buttered popcorn. Not like, not like movie theater popcorn, because there's a bunch of other stuff that goes into that. But that legitimately tastes exactly like buttered popcorn. Like, I... There's no other way to describe it. That tastes really good. I mean, the texture is weird, because it's liquid instead of solid, but it is... Wow. That legitimately tastes like... I took a bite. I just ate a bunch of buttered popcorn with a little with a little bit of salt on it. Honestly, I can see that with a little bit of salt. And like, I ate it. I swallowed it. I walked off of my day, and it tastes like the flavor that is left behind when after I eat the popcorn. Wow, I'm actually quite impressed on that. Now, the recipe that I used for the um, for the the whole the whole the whole entire cocktail which i completely forgot to write on the board my goodness i will fix that still getting used to this whole system here it's called the cinema highball that's what that's what we're doing it's called a cinema highball because it's supposed to remind you of the cinema i will say the fact that i'm even remembering at all that i'm not updating the board properly is an improvement as to just being completely unaware of it previously. Um, but the recipe for the popcorn infused rum called to use Flor de Caña four year rum. Um, I've never had that before. I've never heard of Flor de Caña rum, but it looked, it seemed like it was uh, equivalent to my Myers, maybe. I'm probably completely incorrect about that. The rum connoisseurs out there can correct me on that. That was really good. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm actually really curious to think, if anybody has ideas of what else to use popcorn-infused rum on, please, by all means, let me know. Because it's it's like, because, well, we'll continue with the rest of the cocktail recipe here to explore how the original recipe calls to use it. So, this is used in a recipe called the Cinema Highball. The Cinema Highball is to evoke the feeling, the taste, the experience of being at your local cinema, which is naturally accompanied by corn in its popped most form. The Cinema Highball combines all the wonderful elements of the movie theater together, including your popcorn, your Coca-Cola, and that's it. That's apparently it. Well, I, I just looked closer at that recipe, and I think that's pretty much it. To make the popcorn-infused rum, large container, combine the popcorn, it sells all the instructions, strain it the container to the freezer, strain through a fine mesh strainer, store at room temperature, use within two weeks. To use within two weeks, apparently. Make the cocktail in an ice-filled cons, combine popcorn and Coca-Cola. Stir and serve. That's it. To make the, the, to make the cinema highball, you're just combining this and some Coca-Cola. It's basically, it is basically just the rum and coke except your rum has been infused with popcorn and your coke is still coca-cola maybe a little watered down because your local cinema airs on the cheaper side what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna grab myself the closest thing that i have to a highball glass over here i have my rum it's been infused with popcorn and i can grab myself a thing of coca-cola and luckily you've got plenty of plenty of cans out there
it was brought to my attention earlier uh, i think it's not it's not coca-cola i think it's pepsi that there's a peeps pepsi going around right now and i did manage to pull the strings of my sources and i will be gaining a couple bottles of that the peep infused pepsi so maybe we'll explore that next week next week on next week's cocktail stream so what do you need to do you need to combine two ounces or about 60 milliliters of your popcorn infused rum with four ounces or about 120 milliliters about 118 milliliters of your coca-cola into a highball glass i'm just going to fill this glass here all the way up with ice and we're just going to use that I don't quite recall whether this glass is the exact is the exact correct size for a highball, but you know what? It'll be all right. And honestly, to drink this, what I would probably do is add a add a straw in there. So that's just what I'm going to do. We don't have to shake it or anything. We're just building it. To build it real good. So let me, let me in in preparation grab myself a straw because I think I'm going to need this one. Put that in there. Does it garnish with anything? It really doesn't. I don't think if you're at a movie theater and you're gonna garnish. In, in the thing of the movie theater, if you had like one of those little like uh, paper cutouts of a little movie reel, kind of like the, um, you know, stuff that looks like, stuff that looks like this. But it's on a stick, but, it, but it's also like in your highball glass with your liquid and ice and stuff. That's, that's the cinema highball. That's, that's what we're making here. Yo, what's up, Pobo Mojo? We're making cocktails. We've made a couple of cocktails so far. Have you ever been to the movies? Cinema Highball? Cinema? Cineball. Yeah, I'm just going to say that and just move on. It's a rum and Coke, but the rum tastes like popcorn and the Coke still tastes like Coke. So that's what we're going to do. Yo, I bought a vacuum sealer. Ooh, this is exciting. This is exciting. I've always wanted to get myself a vacuum sealer, specifically because I like, I like, to, I like to preserve my food. Um, and if I had a vacuum sealer, I'd be able to preserve my food better. But for now, I just stick into the freezer that I've got downstairs. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. We need... What was I doing? I need rum and coke. That's all, that's all I need to do. So that's all I'm going to do. I need two ounces. So I'm going to put it into my... I'm going to use my two ounce thingy, Bob. Bob. Two ounces are about 60 milliliters of your popcorn infused rum. Add that to your glass. I'm gonna go mushrooms from popcorn. Mushrooms from popcorn. That sounds exciting. I actually just started following this guy on TikTok who he I saw a video of his where he was making mushrooms in a book, and I was like, this is awesome. I love mushrooms. Not necessarily the psychedelic kind. I like to eat shiitake mushrooms. I like portobello mushrooms. I like I like mushrooms. I like to eat them, I like the taste of them. Um, however, what an excellent sound. I also like the fact that you can make music from mushrooms. Dude, if I haven't talked about myco music before, y'all gotta get on that. You t attach electrodes to the mushroom that measures the voltage of their bio signals and feed that into a synthesizer and an amplifier and stuff, and it's fucking wild, dude. Myco music, it's awesome. You ever eat lion's mane mushroom? No, but I actually saw some at the store today. I saw that, and I think it was oyster or something or other. I've never had lion's mane before. I was uh, I was meaning to. At some point, I, I will, but I just haven't, like, I don't exactly know how to cook lion's mane. And I'm not much into, Anna's not super duper duper, my fiance into uh, mushrooms as well. Neither is most of the people I surround myself with, so, yeah, I'll have to wait. I'm adding four ounces of Coca-Cola. And that's it. It's basically just a rum and coke. The hardest part was creating the popcorn-infused rum, and honestly, that wasn't that difficult anyway. Popo Mojo says, Lion's Mane tastes like crab. Well, I think Lion's Mane is an exp it's an expensive... It's an expensive mushroom, is it not? Like, and I guess it's because of its uh, desirable qualities. Desirable... I, I can understand if it tastes like crab. Of course you want to have a piece of that. It tastes delicious. I am going to take this beautiful popcorn-infused rum and put it down with the rum collection, which happens to live over here. I personally have no idea what else to use popcorn infused rum for. If anybody has any ideas, requests, or otherwise, we will do it. We have it as an ingredient. So I'd be happy to explore that with y'all if you were so willing to explore with me. You ever make a Bloody Mary? No, actually. Bloody Marys are a very 
What's the word I'm looking for? A Bloody Mary is something that I need to spend the time to appreciate, to create, to put the effort into. Actually, I have had a Bloody Mary. Let me correct that. It was Master of Mixes, Bloody Mary mixed, mixed with vodka, and that was probably one of the most putrid drinks I've ever had in my life. Second to the uh, Jaeger Salsa, which is combining Jaegermeister and Salsa together. Don't even ask how that happened. It was about a year ago. It was also on a stream. Ugh. Um, but I've never liked any Bloody Mary that I've had. And I think it's because I haven't put in the effort to make my own Bloody Mary, which if I had to make it myself, which I probably should, fresh tomato juice, probably like a V8 or something, Tabasco, Worcestershire, maybe Cholula. I really like Cholula. Some salt, and you garnish that shit with like celery and stuff. Oh, and of course, vodka. I don't know why you'd put it in your spirit. Well, actually, I feel like I do like a Reposado tequila in that. Anyways. Eventually, I, I do at some point want to do an entire theme stream where we just do bloody bloody cocktails, bloody Marys, bloody Juan's, bloody otherwise. I'd love to do that. Oh, you ever put bacon in it? No, I've never put bacon in it. I got some nice pancetta downstairs that I've been meaning to... Yeah, I, I actually used it on... I had pancetta on my burgers the other day. It was beautiful. So... The Cinema Highball was created by using 2 ounces, or about 60 milliliters, of popcorn-infused rum, 4 ounces, or about 118-ish milliliters, of your Coca-Cola, and you just combine them together. With a little bit of ice, I stirred it up just a little bit, there's some more butter, there's butter bits floating around in there. Um, but it's probably fine, and it's supposed to taste like... I don't know. Something evocative of the cinema. Hmm. Well, so... You know how I said the rum tastes like popcorn? Well, it does. The rum straight up tastes like popcorn. It tastes like buttered popcorn. And there's a piece of that that is great. It's wonderful. It's magical, even. I put Coca-Cola in it. And Coca-Cola tastes like Coca-Cola. So when I saw this recipe, I thought, you know what? Maybe something cool is happening here. Maybe we're doing something like really, really like, you know, splendorific. Um, if you've ever been the, the, the person to, I don't know, accidentally spill Coca-Cola into your popcorn container at the movie theater and you're like, ah, shit, but you can't go anywhere because you're in the movie theater. It'd be rude to get up and walk away and you'd miss the best part of the movie if you took your popcorn and, you know, go and got some new ones. So you decide to yourself, you know... Can't be that bad. I'll take a couple pieces of this, of the Coca-Cola soaked popcorn. Yeah. It tastes like popcorn soaked in Coca-Cola. Except there's no, there's no, there's no crunch to it. There's no, there's no satisfying crunch of the one burnt kernel at the bottom that you're like, oh God, Jupiter Ascending is a pretty shitty movie, but at least I got these kernels to enjoy. I don't think that's very good. Is it accurate? It's it's accurate. This absolutely tastes like popcorn and Coca-Cola. Except it's at the same time. And I think more more generally, I pace myself at the movie theater. And there's a hell of a lot more salt in that. You know. I have salt up here. I don't have salt up here. Oh come on, man. Ah. Oh. Salt up here. I've got some tahini up here. That's salty enough. I kind of want to see if I can recover this. Here's some tahini. It's chili lime salt. It actually tastes worse. No, nope, I take that back. Alright, that's terrible. I don't like that. Nope, I don't like that at all. <laughs> is it true to its name? Yes. It is a cinema highball. A highball in the sense that it's got soda in it, and it reminds you of the cinema. But not the good parts of the cinema. It does not remind me of the movie. It reminds me of the awkward armchairs 
that that they, they don't go back far enough but like when you do go back too far like your legs lift up and you're actually kind of jackknifing in your street in, in your seat but you're also at an amc movie theater and you tried to order a burger off the menu and it's been 25 minutes and they still haven't brought it yet and you're like dude we're basically halfway through the movie where's my cheeseburger i spilled my coca-cola into my popcorn and i'm regretting every moment of this anyway um you're in a movie theater and you spill popcorn or coca-cola in your popcorn and, and that's it. I'm not drinking any more of that. That's that's terrible. I'm gonna go back to my chicha, actually. I don't like that at all. Um, that was the cinema highball. I've described it three or four times already. What did we do this stream? <laughs> what did we do? Well, my little dude next to me would imply that there had something to do with corn. It's corn. A small lump with knobs. It has the juice. It has the juice. I can't imagine a more beautiful thing. It's corn. I just told you all about it. I mean, look at this stuff. That's, that's all I can say here. We covered bourbon. Bourbon uses at least 51% corn as a part of its mash bill. We also had some Rittenhouse rye on there as well, which is, has, I think, 37% corn on it. We tried a couple of different old fashions to see if the percentage of corn and rye and wheat, barley, malted, has any effect on the taste of the old fashioned. It kind of does. I personally like Larceny, small batch, 92 proof, old fashioned, because it tastes a lot like corn. Mellow corn tastes like corn, except more towards the end. Excuse me as it's had a chance to warm up. Rittenhouse Rye in your old fashioned, it's it's pretty good. Um, old Granddad, Bottle and Bond, not really my favorite. There's there's too much rye there, not enough everything else going on. Didn't really like that. We also moved into creating a cocktail called Chicha Andina. Chicha Morada uses purple corn, kind of boils it up. Uh, you can combine it with other things. It's almost kind of like a sangria, whether fermented or not. You can have it alcoholic or not. And it's a warm beverage that's enjoyed in Peru. Now, Chicha, Andina is a recipe that uses sweet corn, the yellow white corn instead, and you don't do any of that boiling process. Instead, you kind of blend it up into some corn milk, you combine it with a couple other things, notably cinnamon syrup, pineapple juice, and rum, and some, I think it was Angostura and some lemon juice in there, to create a cocktail that is very, very pleasant, not super alcoholic, and even after it's been sitting for a little while, Still tastes almost as good as when we had it. It's very molassesy. If you use a Myers rum in this, like I did, a dark rum, it is going to carry through to the end, not disappointingly. Very, very tasty. And then finally, we did something. I, I just, I just wanted to try it. It said popcorn. I thought corn, 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 corn. We took popcorn, put it into rum, let it sit for an hour. Then we removed the popcorn from the rum and put some butter into it. Let that sit for 24 hours. Then we put the entire thing into the freezer for about two to three hours and then took out the butter from it, or at least most of it, and then combined that popcorn butter infused rum with Coca-Cola to create a cinema highball, which just tastes disappointing. But accurate to the name, I will say, all things considered. And that is at least a small sub-portion of all the ways that there is indeed corn in your cocktails. And with that, that's all I've got for this evening. And I thank you all very much for joining me. I am done. And that's the end of it, folks. That's all I've got planned for this cocktail stream this evening. I hope you learned a thing or two. Maybe you're drinking your bourbon straight, otherwise, on the rocks or something. But remember, there's a grain in there. A sweet grain. A corny grain. A grain that is like, vital to the American... I guess experience, I suppose. I don't know, manifest destiny or something like that. But corn also appears in many different ways. It might not be distilled. It can be used as a juice, corn milk, or otherwise, including popcorn. It can make an appearance in your cocktails, even though it might not necessarily be the most welcome presence. But it is there, nonetheless. Thank you, everybody, so much for joining in to The Bar with the next this evening. I'll be back again next week with a different theme, as we do every week. Wednesday at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time here on Twitch. VODs show up on YouTube. We put shorts and stuff up on TikTok. I've got a Discord that we put all the recipes and stuff in. If you're the kind of person who doesn't give a shit about the stream itself or the videos and you just want to copy and paste that stuff and use it for your own good, we got no, no bad bud blood there. Copy and paste the recipes in the YouTube description of the Discord. You're good. I understand because I'm that kind of person too sometimes. In any case, I hope y'all are having a wonderful evening so far. If it's the sun that you see on your side of the world, then I hope you're having a wonderful rest of your day. May it be twilight, dawn, midnight, or otherwise. The party continues wherever we are, and we'll see y'all again next time. Until then, y'all, bye.